In a world where nostalgia rages across the land, where everyone and their mother has a podcast, where there's still a movie trailer guy who says, in a world, three friends revisit films, shows, and games that molded them as they search for answers to life, the universe, and everything in between. Settle in and join us for Screen Refresh. Welcome back to Screen Refresh, a show where we revisit the films, shows, and games of our childhood to try to take another look at what we fell in love with. I'm Nick, and tonight I've got not one, but two co-hosts joining me, Dean and Tim. He's got two. <laughs> I have nothing else to add to that, <laughs> but I'm here too. And tonight we're talking about Jingle All the Way. Never heard of it. Dean, you know, you mentioned in the pre-show that um, you haven't watched it much. And with your hobby enthusiasm of toy collecting, I'm surprised that you haven't really watched this as much. I feel Arnold's pain in this movie, for sure, in some cases. <laughs> Except he's not yeah, trying especially to... Especially the beginning. He's not trying to flip a uh, Turbo Man doll on Reddit or something. I meant more so I have a creepy neighbor that like is trying to get with my wife. And I have to, I have to <laughs> constantly bench press more than him to prove my word well dean you know you can't bench press your way out of this <laughs> bill hartman is a goddamn treasure to preserve all of his appearances in the national archives so nick what was your first introduction to this movie movie came out in theaters and it was a christmas movie and it had arnold and you were just like yep butts and seats well it was this it was age appropriate so my mother my mother took me to go see it there wasn't anything like real, like, oh, I need to go see this. It's just, it came out November 22nd, so perfect, you know, Christmas time. And um, she was like, hey, you want to go see this? I'm like, sure. And then when we went to go see it. And then especially during the 90s, um, it seems like all the avid toy rushes are for those that are over the age of 25. But um, back then, that was the huge craze for toys like this between like power rangers and um you know tickle me elmo was a very huge deal when it came out and that's, pretty that's much the biggest one i remember yeah, yeah and tickle me elmo i think was the inspiration for this movie well i, or, I think yeah. they said originally it was supposed to be like the the 80s cabbage patch craze and then it just happened to coincide with this releasing and it's like and tickle me elmo blew up that season yeah Cause I mean, that was, I didn't, I was well past Sesame street. And even when it came out, I didn't understand the big deal, but I do distinctly remember going to like KB toys, looking for specific power Rangers toys with my mom going, you know, right before they opened up waiting in line, running in with all of the other customers, just like how in the one scene in the movie later on <laughs> that exact exact thing i got to experience firsthand and it's it's pretty crazy and it's all those like memes of people rushing through walmart on black friday i mean that shit's real it's just crazy on how certain toys and just collectibles and just products in general can cause a hype like that i've never seen that in person but i honestly would love to just see that one time i yeah, probably like maybe i'd regret it but <laughs> I feel like growing up, we were always one season behind the new thing. So, like, we never waited in lines for the new toy, the new game, the new whatever, For usually, for the most part. Um, so this was a lot of just, I understood it from a distance, but I was never, like, slammed against a wall waiting for a door to open kind of deal. Although I feel like that's probably where people are at right now with like PlayStation 5s and the Xbox uh, Series X and whatnot. I was always behind on on systems growing up. But then later once I got my own money, I think the first system I ever like joined, like, you know, got it in the first month or so was maybe the Xbox One. Everything else was just like waited till new ones or new versions came out the slim yeah i usually always waited until like the elite version or whatever came out afterwards yeah i was late to the party on all the modern systems ps3 xbox xbox i got like practically end of life it still got 
you know, it's fair use out of it with me, but I didn't, I remember when the Xbox 360 came out, that definitely was, people were waiting in line, they were super excited, and the hype was real. I remember working at that point in time in an adult job, and all the guys there were like, yeah, I'm going to Best Buy tonight to pick up the Xbox, the 360, it's going to be awesome. Yeah, I remember the Best Buy back home and people would have like tents and they would camp outside for the opening and whatnot. And I I don't think I've ever, I'm almost jealous that I don't think there's anything I've coveted enough that I would wait outside in line overnight in a tent. I honestly don't even know what that could be for me. I'm trying to think myself. I mean, I don't know. Like, I remember when there was a guitar center that opened up near us. It was a big deal. I remember there was a huge launch party, lots of people there, raffles, prizes, and it was cool. I got into instruments, and I was always going there every week. And I noticed one of the cheaper guitar pedals for a distortion was like 40 bucks, But it was always listed as full retail being like $50, $60, and it was $40, or like it was, and it was on sale for $40. And the price never changed. It always remained like that, and they always marketed like, you're getting such a great deal. This pedal is normally 60 but we're selling it to you for 40 But <laughs> they never sold it for 60 It was always 40 So in my eyes, it's just, it's a $40 pedal. What, where can I buy it for the full retail that you say that it is? And over the years... I always kind of paid attention to that. So with Black Friday deals, I don't really care for a lot of it. Like my phone, like we're recording this just after Thanksgiving and my phone's constantly going off with like, hey, this is Target. You should come by and check out our deals with this. Or, you know, BJ's has all these different deals for electronics and TVs. And like, how do I know this isn't just shit that you've been selling for $300 all year? You hiked up the price like two weeks before Black Friday, and now you're discounting the difference to say that I'm now saving money, but in reality, you're still selling it for the same amount. Yeah. I mean, I know there are places where you can get amazing deals from and stuff, but just, I always feel there's, I mean, this is capitalist America, man. Like, there's, <laughs> they ain't giving me a 10 grand TV for 50 bucks. There's no free without lunches. There being, yeah, there's, there's definitely something going on with it, so... Because it's either that or they're trying to, like, unload, like, extra inventory and whatnot. So it's... Mm -hmm. Right. The deals are usually on middling yeah. products. Yeah. It's like, please take this. These pitiful 4K TVs, they have 8K now. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> um, I know Camel, Camel, Camel exists for exactly that purpose. Only it's specifically for Amazon, but... If they're like, check out this deal, and you check it on Camel, 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 it'll show you, no, it was this price like two months ago. <laughs> they jacked it up in the last week, and now it's on sale. Data analysis is valuable information. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why it's such a big uh, privacy thing. And Yeah, I bet they're not happy about saving and... cookies now, huh? <laughs> hey, they shouldn't have just accepted like the terms and conditions. <laughs> Two -way street, Some buddy. sites are just like, accept the cookies. I saw one today that was like, please don't sell my information. <laughs> like, that was the other option. <laughs> I was like, oh, they're really, really upfront about it. <laughs> that's a whole separate discussion because that's, I can digress pretty hard on that one because that's just, <laughs> I mean, short end. Rule of thirds, top three favorite user agreement violations. I mean, it's um, just, I, I shouldn't have to tell you not to sell my private information. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> That's like me going over to your house for dinner and as you pull out the knives, me telling you earnestly, please don't stab me. Like it's kind of intended that you're not going to stab me. So if I give you this info, why should I expect you to sell it? You sh like, if you're going to sell it, cut me in on it, you know? Yeah. And also if I go over to your house and you're like, please don't stab me. I actually kind of want to stab you now. <laughs> I wasn't gonna, but now you I gotta make me there. take a hard look at my. It would make me take a hard look at my decisions in the past. Like, what have I done <laughs> Do I to give let that lead yeah. Nick to this point? <laughs> Do I have that aura? Please don't kill us. Please don't make it so appealing. So, jingle all the way. As mentioned before, it was released in November twenty second, nineteen ninety six. It was directed by Brian Levant, 
who is also best known for the live action remake of the Flintstones and its sequel, uh, Beethoven, and sat in as a writer for many TV shows from like Happy Days to even producing episodes of Mork and Mindy. It's a pretty pretty good TV. Like, pretty good TV run. More from more. He had a lot of different stuff here and there. I just kind of cherry picked the best things that I, at least I recognized anyway. But he'd been directing and he'd uh, rather he'd been in the business for quite a while. Um, we've got quite the cast in this too. We have the the late Phil Hartman as the sleazy neighbor. Simbad, who I swear steals the scene every single time he's on screen. <laughs> Young Anakin Skywalker himself, uh, Jake Lloyd, as Howard Langston's son. And we even have Jim Belushi as a mall Santa. There's other stars in here too, but the real star of the whole show. But the real star, Schwarzenegger, led this comedy instead. Usually he does um, action, but this was one of his, um, I think, one of his best comedies that he's done. It's it's such a disheartening thing to see, at least for me, of this is like a 17% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's critically panned, and it seems like everybody online hates it. And I don't know if it's people genuinely don't like it, or if it's the people started making fun of it and then everybody wanted to be a part of that so they all jump on like let's gang pile jingle all the way i mean it's it's not an oscar winning film what? yeah i saw it when i was fucking 10 you yeah. know like it w people like on tiktok when i watch all of the star wars videos it's very like split crowd and it's Gotten to the point where I don't even like Star Wars anymore, and it's not even because of the shit that I watch, it's the goddamn fans. Sometimes you just need to sit back and realize this shit is not meant for you. You're allowed to watch it. Absolutely. This has Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sinbad, huge fucking names at that time. You're allowed to sit in and watch it. But just because you know Schwarzenegger from Predator and Running Man and Commando and Twins and all of these other fucking movies he's been in doesn't mean that this is targeted for you. This movie was for me and my age group for everything that I've been wanting to do. It's targeted at my mother for everything that she knew that she had to do the exact same way that Arnold did. Running to all the different... Uh, Your mom was Turbo Man? She is in my heart. <laughs> um, you know, running to all the different... Uh, I keep wanting to say candy shops, but no, like the, the the toy stores. Toys? Yeah, trying to find the big hot thing of that current season. You know, it. it that's exactly all it boiled down to. And I personally loved it. And the fact that Rotten Tomatoes gives it so low, like, fuck them. You know, it's... The amount of times that it's just constantly having to sift through that exact thing of is it a real bad movie or is it because someone popular said it was bad so immediately everyone else must hate it as well and it's just a bandwagon. Because I mean it's like I said it's definitely not an Oscar winning film. I still found it enjoyable. There's still stuff I chuckle at. And if I were to compare it to, like, I'm not even saying necessarily everything recent in terms of kids or family films are bad. There's a lot of good stuff, too. But a lot of the things that you compare it to, even from around the time or, like, even now, it's like, yeah, it's head and shoulders above some of that stuff that, like, is irritating to even be on in the background. Like this, I'll sit down and I'll actually watch. I think this is the most comedy forward of the... Arnold movies at the time just for the fact that granted we had like kindergarten cop we had him doing twins but even those end up involving like murders and crime and other things involved in the movie even though it's predominantly a comedy this one's just straight up a family comedy the the beginning of kindergarten cop you could have put it at the like the beginning of the terminator and you wouldn't have known the difference it has that same exact aesthetic you know, he's just, you know, his skin is glistening from sweat. He's wearing like a trench coat. He's holding a gun, <laughs> chasing bad guys. You would have thought it was any other action movie. And you don't realize that this is him pretending to be a freaking kid, like a kindergarten teacher. You expect him to be like getting chased by Chris Sarandon into a toy store. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Give me the power, I beg of you. 
<laughs> Do it, come on, Ricky. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think it gets a bad rap. It's definitely not the the best film of its generation, but I think it definitely is uh, undeservedly panned and worth some fun. Um, budget was estimated at sixty million dollars and made roughly about twelve. 12 the thing I don't I don't know is the numbers. Um, I don't know if it's adjusted for inflation or if that's just. So the numbers I'm going to give, I don't know what they were then versus now. So I'm just going to say a bunch of numbers. Regardless, it's still a lot of money. <laughs> so their budget was estimated at 60 mil. They made about 12 million in its opening weekend and made about 60 mil domestically and 129 million worldwide. But its competitor that weekend, Star Trek First Contact, made almost double that opening weekend. With the Borg? I've never seen any of them. That movie's not beloved right i that's actually my favorite star trek movie is it oh man, what am i th- am i thinking of nemesis yeah that one yes yeah. yeah yeah Did, was this a i know it was a dumb question was this a christmas like week movie or was it like december november 22nd oh no so thanksgiving yeah ish movie gotcha yep and then amazingly enough just the week prior and somewhat topical uh the original space jam made its debut and that totaled a gross of uh, ninety million. Wow! So actually, yeah, if this so came out uh, November twenty second, nineteen ninety six, did we just miss the twenty fifth anniversary of Jingle All the Way? Mm-hmm. So this is like a a milestone event. It's it is. <laughs> it now is serendipitous. So as a heads up. With this movie, apparently there's um I watched the extended family fun edition. <laughs> and it has additional that's actually what it's called. Boy how and it has um it has cut content restored into it. So it's a lot of it is just super quick scenes. It adds zero to the movie and you could have easily cut out pretty much every single one of them, except for the one during that fight scene. But aside from that, I mean it... additional Santa deaths. <laughs> He's got a kill count of seven. <laughs> One for every reindeer. <laughs> so the movie opens up with action. A superhero bursting through stone uh, through a stone wall towards the camera. The music fanfares bring us back to the age of Power Rangers meets Buzz Lightyear kind of TV action show. Power Rangers is exactly what I wrote down. Yeah. Oh, yeah. With the demon uh, team. Young child. I like them. I wish they had a little bit more. To the, the whole movie, they were like but... putties with pizzazz. Yeah, right. Uh, a young child yells out for the hero Turbo Man to watch out. The villain sends his minions to fight Turbo Man and his faithful pet tiger Booster. But the four, uh, but in the foray, the villain manages to kidnap the kid and threaten to throw him over a nearby rock cliff. <laughs> Turbo Man rockets toward the villain, who drops the child. Turbo Man rescues the kid and the villain escapes. Camera refocuses to show that it's actually just a TV show being watched by our young our young child here, Jake Lloyd. Pretty playing Jamie. Pretty solid effects for a kid's show. Yeah, for real. Uh, yeah. Did you, Nick, did you notice the uh who the little kid was in the TV show? No. It was a young Joe Cooper. From hanging with uh, Mr. Cooper, famous beers, beers basketball player. <laughs> wait, wait, what? <laughs> that kid plays young Trey Parker in basketball. <laughs> I just, I saw his face. I was like, oh, it's Joe Cooper. I have to rewatch. He's gonna that. own a be a big sports star. <laughs> I was about to say, like Joe Cooper, the, didn't he own a big sports bar? <laughs> <laughs> I like how in this fake show, where the the president and the first lady are played by Lorraine Newman from SNL and Harvey Corman from like Blazing Saddles and whatnot. You focus in on the guy or the kid who plays the young kid in basketball. So I don't know who the fuck those other people were. You've never seen Blazing Saddles or old school SNL? Yeah. Well, not old school. No, not really. I, I skipped over that entirely and I just said Jake Lloyd. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's... Oh, I definitely know who Carvey Horman is. Carvey, <laughs> Carvey, Carvey Horman. Horman. 
poor man. Um, that's Headley Lamar. I just didn't know that that was him. Yeah. He doesn't have a mustache, does he? And he's probably his hair is a little whiter. Probably, yeah. I completely did did not recognize him, but yeah, I know who he is. There's a, so many of those little parts throughout this movie of just like, oh, hey, it's that person. Yeah. Two in the Santa Claus scene. And it's not even like bit part actors. It's like, no, these are people who had like starring roles and things and whatnot. It's just fun to see them pop up. It was probably just everybody wanted to work on a uh, a film with some of the cast. Either it's because they like Phil Hartman or they probably like Arnold. So when we see that it's actually Jamie watching the show... Uh, he's actually about to get ready to leave. His mom asks him to, you know, start getting dressed. Hey, Jamie, why don't you go upstairs and change, hon? It's almost time to leave. But Dad's not home yet. Now he's probably going to miss me get my belt. Karate belt. This is everything. Well, he's not going to miss this. He's probably just working really hard. But we cut away to a, a holiday party that John McClane would hate to go to. <laughs> we see the office as uh, the camera zooms around, seeing people drinking, partying, have a good, having a good time. With the best Christmas spread I've ever seen Hell in my yeah. life. I'd go to that one. Well, I like Sooner how mine. Jamie is complaining and worried that his dad's going to miss his class. And then it cuts to this. And instead of just being like, oh, but Howard is like enjoying the party and schmoozing around. It's like, and then it cuts from the party to his office. And he's just like, no, he's working. He's getting work done. He is working. <laughs> so it's not just him like lollygagging. It's like, no, he's here because he's still getting stuff done. He's a workaholic. Hey, mm -hmm. he, they have a pretty nice house. Jamie's room seems like it has a lot of nice things. Somebody's got to pay and for all that. And he's known to never meet his promises and always working too much. And I don't know, there's a fine line between working to live and living to work. And I think he's regretting his home life just so he can continue working. But well, that's what turns Jamie to the dark side. It does. <laughs> I wonder if he delivers his promises at work to his uh, clients. Nope. Remember, you're my number one customer. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, and that's the best part is that you know his admin comes over while he's working and with like signs so that I could read it. He can read it as he's talking to his clients, and she's warning him that you know you're going to be late to your kid's karate ceremony. But he keeps taking calls after calls, and eventually his wife calls him, and he's such a workaholic that not even thinking as he's like. Uh, closing the conversation with his wife he says his pitch line to her and he's just like oh shit I, I i didn't mean it and just the look on her face of just utter disgust is you can tell that that is not the first time he's done something like this so right off the bat you can tell that he's not too good of a family man he's a good guy he's got a you know his heart's in the right place but he's always late and missing all of his uh kids stuff it almost reminds me of, like the beginning of like um peter pan with robin williams yes and it almost has the same and the cats in the cradle it almost has the same kind of story beat in the beginning on how you know he gets in his car he drives as fast as he can he gets up on the highway and sure enough there's dense afternoon traffic the traffic makes sense though. yeah it's like probably after yeah he should have taken the 405 during that's a thing, right? <laughs> I'm from the East Coast. I don't know. <laughs> uh, speaking of that, are they in Chicago? Uh, Is that um, where they are? Uh, they look like a, a little, a big little city. I thought it was in like somewhere in Minnesota. Minnesota. Oh, yeah, maybe. It's actually pretty easy to figure out where. Because of all the aerial shots at the end, I'm like, is that Chicago? Bloomington, Minnesota. 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 Yeah, it was actually, my connecting flight is there on the way home this week. Once again, I'm in a hotel for work. But I should I should cancel my <laughs> I should cancel my flight and then just go around Minnesota filming all of the the jingle all the way locations. You should check out the Mall of America. I'm actually curious to see if it's like in decline with the rest of all the malls across the country. I know if I go into the mall now, it's like a ghost town. A little busier because of Christmas, but I remember I had yeah, to go in I'm there. Yeah, I'm not right now, but yeah. I had to go in there like last summer. <laughs> back in May. And it was, there was like nobody here. And even pre-pandemic, it was practically dead. I miss the aesthetic of malls because it's, 
growing up in the 90s, it always had this like magic to me of it's like all of these different stores and I could go to the food court and I could go see a movie and I could go like hang out with my friends. I don't think I really buy much at malls, so I'm probably part of the problem. <laughs> But it's just the that aesthetic. I, I avoid them like the plague now. I blame X-Men the Animated Series from the 90s on making me just really love malls. <laughs> I'm not expected that to be the answer. <laughs> hey, when the, when the pilot episode opens at that mall, and I'm like, I am 100% on board with malls. Also, to this day, I think that is the perfect example of how to properly introduce people to all of your characters in a short amount of time and get their personalities watch x-men the pilot episode is going to the mall just uh, oh, okay let's all go to the mall today <laughs> we see the school jamie comes out in a line of other karate students all wearing yellow belts and it's the promotion ceremony to go from yellow to purple jamie is one of those kids waving to the stands and then here we get to meet um their neighbor phil hartman playing ted <laughs> he seems to be like the the neighborhood handyman, but he is such a fucking slime ball. slut. <laughs> <laughs> is it weird that I thought like, cause I, cause I coming into this, I didn't remember what his character was. I was like, wait, why do they hate Ted? He's like, do, he's doing everything that the father should be doing. <laughs> like, cause the, yeah, he's active in his neighborhood. The women are creepy towards him. So you're like, wait, is he just like, sleeping around because they're all coming on to him a surprising amount of thirst um, thrown in ted's direction <laughs> <laughs> almost alarming <laughs> it, but phil hartman is perfect in this though he is just like the his voice and just his facial expressions when all the women um are just like throwing themselves at him during the the class of like Ted, <laughs> i was wondering if you'd mind taking a look at my porch lights and just doesn't seem to be working and uh, you being such a handyman sure it's like i have the perfect tool for yeah that. Oh, i miss that guy wink wink nudge nudge but then he looked over at uh liz jake Jane, you know jamie's mom and she like rolls her eyes and he's like he changes his expression like oh supposedly i guess phil hartman was originally supposed off. to be we're not supposed to be myron but they were thinking of him for myron and then I guess when they ended up having him read for Ted, it was like, oh, no, you're definitely perfect for Ted. Mm, it's a different energy. Yeah. He tries so hard through the whole movie to get in her pants. And just the thing I don't get is, is everyone seems to be pretty like sharp in terms of just contextual awareness. But every time he tries to, you know, come onto her and like flirt and anything, it just she clearly is not into the guy. It's zero. Yeah, she gives him zero. I mean, also to me, if I had a neighbor, I'm assuming it's not just the day that we saw in this movie. It's probably been going on for longer than that. But if I had a neighbor that just constantly just made weird advances on me all the time, I wouldn't invite him <laughs> over. I wouldn't be like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Like, let's hang out. Let's go somewhere together. I'd be like, no, you're kind of creepy. <laughs> I think it wasn't so much. I don't think um, Liz invited him over on her own accord. I think it was because his kid, Johnny, is friends with Jamie. So when yeah. they're playing together later on in the movie, I think it's just, well, hey, my son's here. I'll stick around. It's like, well, what can, what can you possibly say? You know, like, no, that's that's OK. We just we just want your kid. Yeah, it's like you, you do know that just because your kids are friends doesn't mean you have to be friends. Yeah, because I thought to this the same day, exact thing too. I, I don't think my parents ever talked with any of my friends' parents through like elementary school, ever. It was like yeah, a dead real. drop. They just like left both kids over at an unknown location and would just be like, okay, play. <laughs> I want. I need a five-minute epilogue to this movie. Um, because of what happens between Ted and uh, Liz, like, okay, they're your next door neighbor. Now, how's this going to work from oh, here on out? Like, on the drive home, she just casually mentions, like, the weirdest thing, Ted kind of <laughs> threw himself at me in a car and tried to get me to have an affair. And he's like, I'll break him. <laughs> I'll bench press him. <laughs> Wait. Also, the 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 kids all come out in yellow belts. Does do they just push kids through the belts like just so nobody feels 
upset because like is everybody a yellow belt or like some kids don't make it some kids I think do. not every was everyone in a yellow belt because I thought there were some kids who were already I, in different I, ones I, maybe I was wrong I've never done I could be wrong martial arts Karate. my exposure to the belt ranking system is pretty much through this movie and that's three away from black <laughs> So any any of our listeners who have done martial arts growing up and no actual information on this, shoot us a message or let us know. I'd be interested to just get some background. All right, let's yeah, let see. us know if there's participation belts. Yeah. Yes, there are um, kids in the background as Jamie's collecting his purple belt. There are kids in the back with green. <gasps> and right. one child okay. with a black belt just off in the distance in the shadows. I- Smoking a cigarette. <laughs> Rudy. <laughs> I think personally, the belt ceremony should be the instructor walks in the center of the room, the kids form a circle, and then he says, fight me. And then they all pile onto him, <laughs> and any of the survivors instantly get upgraded one belt. So he kills them. Yeah. The whole time while during the ceremony, Jamie is um, while while Jamie is getting his belt, Arnold just sit there, you know, stuck in traffic. He looks over to the breakdown lane and seeing that it's empty, he decides, "Let me drive it down the breakdown lane. I'll skip all this traffic." But um, he doesn't get really far because at that point, a highway patrol officer sees him and pretty much immediately pulls him over. Howard tries to smooth talk his way out of it. But the cop just isn't having any of it. So at that point, he asks him, you know. Step out of the vehicle. So as we're cutting back and forth between Howard and Jamie doing the ceremony, we see that the cop is now making him do a sobriety test. And it's just, he's trying to rush because he needs to make it to his kid's thing. But the cop is like, no, fuck this. I got, like, you know, your ass is mine. So he makes him do the line. I feel like it's a gross misuse of power. He kind of deserved it. Arnold was kind of a kind of he did kind of a dick. He's driving in the shoulder. Yeah, bypassing traffic. Yeah, give him a ticket and let him go. You know, you know, Don't every... be like, oh, you're headed to your nah. kid's thing. I'm gonna waste the rest of your night so you miss it. Good luck well, never having yeah. those memories. Jamie gets his promotional belt. He goes from yellow to purple. Um, Ted's son Johnny gets his belt. Um. But by the time Howard finishes his sobriety test, he has to do the alphabet backwards and then finally gets in his car and he's you see him walking up into the school and this you know, it's a ghost town. He he's clearly missed it. I didn't make it. <laughs> Which was how long was A, how long is the ceremony? B, how long was he in <laughs> Stuck. Well, the ceremony is 14 Doing minutes. They test. put the kids in the line and everybody has to punch that box to get their belt. And then as they do it, they just put them right into a car and they take off. That's what it seemed like. It's like, damn, like how long did you... Welcome to 30 Minute Dojo. People there. He walks in, like he walked in like he was an hour and a half late. And I'd be like, that's 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 what it looked like. <laughs> like, oh, I wouldn't expect to see anything after Shows up, it's boarded up. It's a different place now. <laughs> So now that we see that uh, he missed the ceremony, it just cuts him pulling into his own driveway. And then as he's walking up to his door, he sees that Ted is on his roof. And Ted, despite trying to be nice, Arnold gives him real passive-aggressive kindness. Clearly, he didn't want Ted on his roof putting up Christmas lights. But um, as he comes inside, he already knows he's in the doghouse. But not so much with his wife, but his son is giving him the cold shoulder. Hi, buddy. Jamie, about the karate class tonight. I was trying to... Jamie? Jamie, stop! Listen, it was not my fault. Jamie, don't walk away from your father. Jamie's pissed. I like how he even tries to explain to his wife, like, oh, I got in traffic. I even got the speeding ticket. She's like, I don't care. It wasn't my karate ceremony you missed everybody is so hard on arnold in this movie and it's like yes he works a lot but looking at their house and all of these things and jamie being able to go to his karate classes and all this stuff it's like 
No, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's working hard to be able to supply all of this stuff they have. Mm. When is enough enough, Tim? Yeah. It's never enough. More things. The material things? Are we missing out on important moments in life? Moments are fleeting. Things are forever. Considering that the kid is uh, completely material biased on this whole thing. Arnold's like <laughs> knee deep in the doghouse. But the second he tries to bribe his kid with a, a toy for Christmas. He had that one in the chamber. He was like, I'm disappointed, Dad. But I won't be disappointed if you get this. Yep. A Red Rider BB gun. What do you want? I want the Turbo Man action figure with the arms and legs that move. And the boomerang suitor. And the rock and roar jetpack. And the realistic voice activator that says five different phrases. Including, it's... Turbo he completely it's forgets all of the bullshit that Arnold has always put him through because he does bring up many different points in that you weren't there for a lot of the big achievements in my life. What the fuck, Dad? And he's like, ah, what you want for Christmas? And that, that pretty much is... that fixes Buy my it. love. I don't know. Yeah, pretty I much. I mean, looking around his room, he has like toys and he has like this huge room and he has a two-wall captain america marvel mural in his room it's like this kid is a pretty i mean it, it's it's no what's his name's from hocus pocus but it's a pretty cool room you know and it was actually really cool to see all that comic book stuff on the walls because this was before marvel kind of blew yeah. up again yeah i didn't even notice that till for the most part yeah, captain so america didn't even really have like a super popular cartoon around that time so it's like now this kid's like in deep. Yeah. I didn't even really pay attention to it until I think maybe a couple of years ago when I rewatched it. Because when I first watched it, I didn't care enough or not so much. I didn't care enough about Marvel, but I didn't recognize a lot of the things that he had in his room. So being that young, I couldn't tell if it was just something they made for the movie like Turbo Man or if it was an, an actual legitimate thing. Because like, I knew about X-Men, I knew about um, Incredible Hulk, and you see those two icons in his room, but I don't really recall much for Captain America. And he, it, you can't miss it. It is like, front it, yeah. and center. I, originally, I was like, walls. oh, he has a giant mural above his bed. And then I'm like, wait, no, that's the entire wall. And then it goes over to the wall by the door, so it's just like a two-wall mural of Captain America. I didn't have anything like that as a kid. I thought that was cool as hell. But Jamie's so disappointed that his dad didn't see him break a box of wood. Arnold's like, I'll fix my shitty parenting skills <laughs> with a shiny new action figure. <laughs> it's terrible time. <laughs> I will say several points through the movie, I, I look back to the actual Turbo Man doll that I have now, thanks to you, Dean. Because uh, <laughs> it was really fucking cool to see that, like, holy shit, I actually have one. <laughs> You are my. It's not the special. You would not no, believe what Dean went through to get that. You are my <laughs> my mall Santa Claus. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Sinbad was really nice in person. <laughs> so with um, them finally bonding and you know water under the bridge, he happily goes back to the bedroom. You know, about to tuck in for dinner or tuck in for um to go to to go to bed. He's talking to his wife. And, you know, he was just recalling all the cool things that they were talking about and how everything is okay Howard, now. You didn't. Please tell me that you did not forget that doll. No, no, I I, I got it. I I got the Turbo Man doll. The one that has the clearly he forgot, but he is kind of a scumbag so dad. I'm sorry, but he lies to his wife right to her face like, don't worry, I got it. And... He says he got it in advance, and they climb into bed. She admits that, you know, this thing is probably impossible to find at this point. And here we just zoom in on Arnold's face like... Because at this point, they'd probably be impossible to find. Deer in headlights, like, what? <laughs> it, it made me laugh back to back in this scene, because it's like the camera... Of her facing the camera, like, doing something at the sink, and he's in the background. And then when she, like, leans down, and the camera just, like, zooms in on his face... And he looks startled about like, yeah, I, I, I have the doll. And then in this, when she's like, because they're super hard to find. And then it's like the music stinger. And you just have like sliver of light going across his eyes. And he just like, all of a sudden <laughs> makes that like a gassed face. Like, ah. Which reminds me, 
You got the doll, right? The doll. This movie made me chuckle probably more than I did as a kid, just because now I can appreciate all of the the Arnoldisms. Adult jokes. Well, the yeah, adult jokes, that yeah. Too. The next morning, Jamie pours himself some Turbo Man cereal as Howard comes down the stairs and he's putting on his jacket. Uh, His wife sees him doing this and, you know, she asks him, you know, where are you going? And he alludes that the D-O-L-L is at the office. But the thing that gets me is the kid is like nine years old. He can't spell doll. If the kid can't spell doll, then maybe you should spend more time working on that and less time working on karate his karate skills <laughs> i think maybe he just still doesn't understand his dad with the accent so. <laughs> I just you're getting the doll the doll what's doll i'm getting the doll <laughs> okay dad whatever you say <laughs> so he lays out the bullshit and his wife is just picking him up pick, picking it up he's like i'm gonna go to the office and get it i'll be right back she's like okay okay be safe out there <laughs> Sorry, I'll be back. <laughs> and then he drives a car through their front window. <laughs> uh, when he gets outside, he's almost run down by Ted and an actual reindeer um, that's charging at him. Ted pulls the reindeer back just in time to prevent Arnie, Arnie from getting hurt. You guys ever? You guys notice the uh, continuity error here? Mm, I did no. not. So he reaches over Arnold, like after Ted pulls the reindeer in to not attack him. Um, they're talking and just idly he goes to reach out to pet the reindeer and he's wearing gloves. But in the close up shot of his point of view, the hand that's about to pet the <gasps> reindeer and the reindeer lunges to bite and he pulls yeah. back. The hand is not gloved. That's a really minor. I mean, that's a you have to be. I think. He really pulled back so them. quickly that his molecules diffused through the fabric of the glove like the Flash. I've seen this movie a lot as a kid, so. <laughs> I That's one of the few that I ever noticed on my own. Like, oh, but it's pretty, you know, you see it like two, three times in a row, you'll pick up on it. Quick. I mean, while but, yeah. Yeah, I had the movie. Hmm? Go ahead, dude. <laughs> on your time. No, no, no. I was just going to say. I had the movie playing, and it happened as you described it. It was kind of amazing. And I saw his hand. I was like, holy shit. <laughs> He's right. With the reindeer almost biting him, the two continue to talk. Good to go. Where are you off to so early? Picking up a Christmas present for Jamie. Whoa! Nothing like waiting until the last minute, Howard, sir. So where'd you get him? Uh, one of those turbo man. He needs to go pick it up. So... Ted is also kind of like they they have that rivalry going back and forth on how they're just he's overly nice but he's a little smug about it. Oh, so Ted proudly says great. to him that I got a Turbo Man for Johnny months ago. It's nestled safely under our tree. And this isn't exactly what Good. Howard wants to hear. So as he's backing his car up, Ted offers friendly advice. To, you know, maybe you should wrap some chains around your tires to counter any icy roads. And Arnold just couldn't contain himself and just utters, Maybe you should drive some chains around you. What? <laughs> the way he <laughs> says it offhandedly, like under his breath, it, I chuckled at that. That was pretty funny. Like, Arnold does have that those was a good like, delivery. little deliveries here and there that just work. Yes. I like that. That was a good one. So we follow Arnold to the local toy store, and it's already swarmed with parents. You know, Christmas Eve, uh, it's probably like... 8 30 9 o'clock like close to you know store opening at this point um he finds out that the store actually opens in just two minutes and he's pushed back to the you know back of the line and here we meet sinbad give a man a break he's a dad trying to get a toy oh, yeah, yeah, have cuts, man. Yeah. last minute shopping huh yeah enough to drive a man insane in it Larrabee. but i think he stole the scene <laughs> anytime he was on camera yeah he has that that manic uh that manic energy. Yeah, I... You're pissed off Robin Williams. I was just about to say, I feel like in another life watching this movie, if Robin Williams didn't play the genie in Aladdin, Sinbad could have taken a pretty good crack at it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. He starts spouting out different, like, conspiracy theories to Arnold, and he just... Corporate America. Hey, he. I was listening, and I'm like, he's, he's not wrong. It's like the media kind of preying on kids to be like, 
you want this toy. If you don't have this toy, you're unpopular. And then kids pushing because they want it. It's not untrue. No. That's kind of what happened, too. A lot of the toys, or, yeah, a lot of the toys that came out during our childhood were made through TV shows just to sell them. Yeah. Like, Transformers, were, the show was just made to sell toys. Same thing with, like, not Power Rangers per se, but it made a lot of money from the toys. Oh, yeah. Turtles. Yeah. All, they're all the same. Mm-hmm. We're all the same. Yeah. Or, like, oh, every season we change the Zords and add new weapons, and it's like... Yeah, because then they can sell all new stuff every year. Yep, got to get the it's new the one. song that super never super new ends. Ones. Wicked smart. Oh, Sinbad, <laughs> just in the middle of his rant, he's like, I'd like to choke somebody. <laughs> he grabs that woman and starts like choking her. You hear the crowd kind of be like, <gasps> but she just kind of looks like terrified. It just, like, ke- being it just keeps going. And then finally he just like drops her body. <laughs> And everybody's like, oh, the store's open, and they just pile in. I like how it takes him a second, a little too long up. to realize, too. Like, oh, shit, I'm, I'm sorry. And he, like, kind of gently puts her down, pats her coat, and he's, like, his little line, like, shouldn't wear fur. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like he's trying to cover for himself. And just as he's putting her down, that's when the toy store opens up the floodgates, and all of the parents just bum rush the employees and charge into the store um comically you see like the um shoe treads on one of the employees face because he yeah, clearly got trampled face got stepped on yeah like <laughs> he just kind of like shakes I, it off i like, know oh, they always do this business. for like laughs <laughs> but i remember years ago i would know people that would like they would do volunteers where you can work like um black friday at like target or walmart or things like that it would just be like hey we need volunteers we'll pay you like 200 bucks for the day to just come do this and i would hear horror stories about people like physically trampling staff and like knocking each other causing physical harm they would have to have like medical teams out there for these things and it's like good god people (laughs) like all for a tv that's 50 dollars cheaper you know like you're already spending a ton of money. Are you really saving that much? I I don't I don't understand Black Friday shopping. I I really don't. Yeah, it's definitely changed over the last over the pandemic for sure. Yeah, it might not ever be the same, which is probably a good thing. Arnold finally gets to the Turbo Man section, but all the shelves are empty. He pulls aside a store employee who happens to be a young Chris Parnell, and uh, desperately asks if there's any in stock. And this is the part where I remember being at like KB Toys looking for Power Ranger stuff, and it felt ex- you know exactly like this scene. I um I got the toy I was looking for, so I didn't have to drive to the next like fifty stores trying to you know find it. But um, in this case with him, he wasn't as lucky. Yes, I'm trying to find a gentleman doll. Me too. Me too. Do you have any more in the back? <laughs> What? See that? <laughs> what these, these guys are looking for a uh, turbo man? A gentleman <laughs> doll, yes. <laughs> and then when the surrounding customers over here as well, they start bursting out laughing too. I mean, you're looking for the hottest selling toy of this Christmas season on Christmas Eve. Did you really expect it to be that but easy? They were so obnoxious about it that when Arnold grabs them by the like collar and like shakes both of them it's like yeah i kind of get it man <laughs> it was kind of funny too the part or like ironic because despite this being a comedy arnold looked like he was about to kill them where's your christmas spirit that's better i feel like i get a version of this when i ask because he's like do you have any in the back maybe because i've asked that so many times when looking for toys. you know how i felt when i was actually looking for the turbo man funko release going into walmart and going into the electronic section because that's where the funko section is and just so i'm looking for this toy i need to know if you guys have it and it's called turbo man and it's (laughs) i know how this sounds but I, it's real, and you guys have one. <laughs> and they looked at me like, 
do you have a serial number or something to scan? And I'm like, no, it's not available online. So I don't know what the UPC is. <laughs> and they're like, well, have you looked in the toy section? And I'm like, I wanted to tell her, like, lady, I work in a help desk. I look up this shit before I have to call people. Trust me. I looked already, and I'm asking you because I already did steps A, B, and C. I can't find it. I need you to do your magic. <laughs> but she walked me over to the section I already looked through, and this toy is fucking big. It's big. It's not like... Yeah, it's 13-inch tall toy. Yeah. So the box is massive. It's not like I'm going to miss it on the shelf. And it just felt so awkward. And I'm just, and I had to show her the TikTok that, that I found. It's like, look, this, this thing's real. Someone found it in a Walmart. <laughs> they picked it up. It's a physical thing that they were able to hold. It wasn't some like fever dream. It's scanned. They paid for yeah. it. So do you guys have it? And it, it, I actually felt like how it, it was in that movie. Just, do you guys have a durable man? No. What if she goes in the back, she comes back and she's like, uh, we're all out. We have booster. I wish. <laughs> that would have been amazing. <laughs> we don't like you, Booster. He gets consumed. Booster gets the shit kicked out of him, figuratively. So he does confess um, as he's being, you know, held, like, grabbed by Arnold that, you know, a, a woman just purchased one and she just walked out. So he tries to uh, rush after her to try to catch her. But this is where uh, Myron slams him with his mail sack. <laughs> yeah, I... I wrote that in my notes. <laughs> I, I knew it, it was going to come up. He's still in, you know, full postal uniform, including his the mail mail the mail carrier satchel, which I thought was funny. It's like he's just going to all these different stores on his, um, you know, because Christmas Eve is still a business day and nothing is closed. I just thought it was funny how he he has his, all the mail that he's supposed to deliver on him, so it's like he's doing all of this stuff on his break several <laughs> times throughout the whole movie maximizing his time right i doubt he delivers a single piece of mail i feel like this is the kind of setup that we would find out at the end that myron was like let go from his job earlier that week and he just doesn't want to let his family know that he's fired you know he's crazy enough that i wouldn't be surprised that might have been its own deleted concept that just never was shot yeah but it was storyboarded or at least uh written in the script well, also, I feel like they, if that was ever the case, they probably went the correct route because, man, that would be such a downer <laughs> with his character to be like, yep, all of this, and he lost his job. Yeah, I mean, the gross negligence he engages in later on, like, uh, I could see him being at the end of his rope. <laughs> <laughs> It probably would have helped uh, to really solidify the motivations for his character at that point. Sick world we're living in. Sick people. <laughs> that quote comes to mind more often than it probably should. It's, it's one of my go-to gifts. <laughs> so he tries attacking Arnold to kind of, you know, get him off course enough to beat him out of the store. But Cause he, he heard the tip, too. Yeah, Arnold um, recovers pretty quick and he runs outside. So this is the first cut scene. Arnold runs outside and he looks around and he spots a woman walking away from the store and a, a big bag in her hand. Um, and it has like the toy store markings on it. And he sees like the pink outline of a like the Turbo Man themed toy. So he thinks, oh, I, you know, excited. He runs down. He chases her down. Um, I didn't look up who this actress was, but she. I do recognize her. I just can't place her as to where she's from. She reminds me a lot of like Jennifer Tilly. She even almost has the same voice, but it's not her. But um, he chases her down. Then he gets her attention. And at first, you know, she thinks he's trying to mug her. So she kind of starts hitting him. But then he's like, no, 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 no. Uh, you know, I, I followed you from the store. And Im <laughs> immediately she changes gears thinking he's going to attack her. But instead of attacking her, she thinks he's trying to flirt with her, and she's completely into it. <laughs> Excuse me, lady. Excuse me. Oh, no. no, I'm not a robber. I'm not a robber. I followed you all the way from the store. Oh, really? Yes, really. There's something I wanted to ask you. Would you like my phone number? Oh, no. I mean, no. It's, uh, I would like you back. My it's like, bag? wow, okay. <laughs> it's turbo it's time. Like Right. <laughs> he offers her three times that she, what she paid, and she's like, "Yeah, sure, fine. Here, take it." Ah, oh, sure. 
what the heck? For that kind of profit, knock yourself out. Oh, thank God. And just in case, here's my phone number. Oh. She gives him her phone number regardless, even though he said no. And she kind of gives him another wink. And that's when uh, she walks away pretty happy. And he's all stoked and like, I did it. I won. And he pulls the toy out of the bag and he sees that it's actually Booster. And just like that, he says that line too, like, oh, nobody wants you, Booster. And then he slams the bag and the toy into the trash. And that's when the theatrical release resumes and he looks up and he sees the, um, the real lady that the guy was talking about in her car. And in the window, he could see the Turbo Man action figure pretty much staring right back at him. He runs after the car trying to flag her town, but the woman sees her or sees him running. And it's the same exact woman that uh, Myron was strangling in the beginning of the whole scene. Oh, She sees that it's him and then she just slams her foot on the gas and he, you know, he uh, isn't able to follow and catch up. And you just see the Turbo Man doll staring at him slowly going away from the camera and utter defeat of Arnold then I definitely didn't see the cut with the deleted scenes in it from there. Um, Cause I, no, I yeah, didn't I either. Completely that was not Although I, I would have liked to have had an additional scene of Arnold doing the nobody likes you booster. <laughs> just because I feel like the crowd did it that one time. Sinbad did it that one time. I would have just liked one of Arnold being like, nobody likes you booster. Cause I feel like comedy comes in threes. It does. They cut it out. They, they, could, they couldn't replace it. I don't want Booster. Until that mob of children murder Booster at the end. There's not many. I think there's only I think there's only like two or three <laughs> total deleted scenes. And like I said, none of them really add anything to the movie. And Arnold is met with defeat pretty much at every tur- corner he turns through this whole movie. So f- this really isn't like a solid victory for him at all. So it no. It cuts into this like search montage with the Just Christmas music. Um, I liked it. And watching the montage, I never stopped to actually look at like all the toys on the shelves as like the camera pans through. And I stopped was this cool. time and I was like, oh my God, these are all the ones that like I loved during this time frame. I think it's just so cool to me that these are all the toys that are would be super popular now. And it's just seeing all of it before it hit its big stride. So, I mean, yeah, comics were popular back then, but I mean, Ghost Rider was not a household name and it's still not now, but thanks to Nicolas Cage, it sure as hell a lot more known today than it was back in 96. Thank you, Nicolas Cage. Same thing with like Fantastic Four. I think they had a cartoon. Yeah. Did they? Yeah. I don't know X-Men did. X-Men was the most popular one because of the Saturday morning cartoon. Yeah, and then the Spider-Man animated series in the 90s. Mm-hmm. Although Spider-Man had Spider-Man and his amazing friends with Firestar and Iceman um, prior to that. But I mean, it's it, all sorts of ones that like I grew up on and a lot of kids grew up on and we had the toys. But like you said, like, as much as I enjoyed Ghost Rider and a lot of people liked Ghost Rider probably throughout like all of those time periods, it didn't really break into mainstream of just like non-comic lovers just like, oh yeah, I know who that is. I know that character. Until we start getting all of the the big movies being released with them. Mm-hmm. Also, I saw a Micro Machines box during one of the montages and I was never, like, I liked Transformers, but I feel like I was always a bigger Micro Machines Z-Bots kid. If you remember Z-Bots. Z-Bots. No. Uh, Google Z-Bots. When you see it, you'll be like, oh, I remember these. Don't do it, like, right now, though. Like, we're recording, but. <laughs> Fun fact, the woman who Arnold flirts with in the deleted scene is Yeardley Smith, the voice of Lisa ah. Simpson. I knew she looked familiar. Yeah, she kind of looks like Jennifer Tilly, no? Kind of a little bit. I see where you're coming from there. Yeah, and her voice had that same kind of cadence to it too. Yeah, that Lisa Simpson cadence. So through the melancholy montage of Arnold driving from toy store to toy store, only finding Booster, the evil villain Dementor, 
and No Turbo Man Toys to the backing soundtrack of the Christmas song by Nat King Cole. We eventually see him pull up to... No, uh, we actually cut back to Arnold's house, and uh, his wife is slaving over the stove and oven, baking cookies while Jamie and Ted's kid Johnny is playing in the living room. Ted uh, insists that she should uh, go upstairs and take a hot bath. <laughs> And the thing that gets me is that she's like, okay, I wouldn't trust this guy to go to the bathroom by myself, let alone take a shower, a bath with this man in my house. Yeah, he hovers pretty severely. Yeah. He's like, oh, you should go take a shower. And she's like, I don't. And then all of a sudden he just walks over and he's just like, go on. You deserve it. Uh Oh, well, uh, okay. But, you know, listen for the other. Takes her apron off. No thanks. That creepy look on his face when his arms are around her waist getting <laughs> Yeah, I wrote down he takes off her kitchen apron by towing the line of sexual harassment and creep with plausible deniability. Because he just <laughs> does it to the point where it's, a, it's fucking creepy. Red <laughs> flags everywhere. But it's just enough that he could just be that kind of guy that is just... You would describe him as, well, he's a hugger. And I just, <laughs> no, no. And it's my, and the only reason I'm defending him, the only reason I'm defending him is because nobody kicks him out of the fucking house. No one likes the guy. He clearly crosses the line, but he's still in the house. Like, I, get out, you know? Yeah. Like, I would have kicked him out. I don't, I, I don't give a shit. But they were too nice about it, so either they didn't see it, too and nice. he had that plausible deniability, or just they were just fucking blind. I love though. After that, he goes back to touch a cookie and burns his hands. <laughs> <It's laughs> like you crumbles. just see that? Yeah, there's just that brimming rage underneath his his fake. He, like uh, yells at the kids. Nice guy routine. Pipe down in there. <laughs> It happens like a couple times where he just has that temper like, roars. <laughs> and here's where we finally see Arnold actually decide to find a payphone, call back at the house. This is the days of before his cell phone, so it's cool to see a payphone again. But he calls the house expecting that his wife to answer the phone, but it was actually Ted instead. And I, I love this exchange between the two of them. <laughs> and... um this this is definitely the most meme worthy of all of the lines through the entire movie, because the whole um, exchange ends up with Ted eating the cookies, and he's like, "Who told you you could eat my cookies?" And he's so <laughs> offended by this entire thing, despite yes, how innocent. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Also, Ted is having like a sexual experience having these cookies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, these cookies! I gotta get the red paper. Like left. his eyes roll back, he sees God. Also, they're just like little flat gingerbreads. Like, how good can they yeah. be? They're like Pillsbury. They're like from a roll. <laughs> so, like, I can't tell if that's just Ted being Ted or Ted knows Arnold hates yeah. him, so he tries to yeah. throw it back in his face as often as possible. But he never shows true contempt for arnold throughout the whole movie and that was the only thing that's weird about the whole thing because he's trying to come on to the guy's wife the entire movie everyone's oblivious to it and no one likes him but no one actually <laughs> well except the neighborhood wives right what if he's doing like the oh these cookies and then it cuts back to phil hartman but he's like not even eating cookies and he's stone-faced just like into the phone <laughs> saying it <laughs> laughing without smiling arnold just wants to talk to his wife and <laughs> i love how they keep counter and then like you know move counter move and then they keep going like they're playing like a metaphorical version of chess so um after screaming like who told you you could eat my cookies just <laughs> let me put liz on the phone and he's like oh howard she's in the shower you want me to go check <laughs> you could tell Arnold's like seconds from cracking. He's like, no, just on your way out. Tell her I'll be a few minutes late. He's like, and that's when Ted counters with just how good those cookies are. And that's where we get the classic line. Put that cookie down now. 
Ted rushes Arnold off the phone, mentioning the next batch of cookies are done, and he just kind of hangs up on him. Howard uh, walks away, and as he's walking away, Myron is there, also on the phone. There's a, he ends up flagging Howard down, and he starts chasing after him. And this is where Myron offers to kind of join up as a team. We can join up as a team. You know, like like Starskin Hutch, uh, like Johnny Quest and Hodge, man. Like Bonnie and Clyde, like I can tell Well, maybe not I can tell because she left. But maybe we can do it. Search and destroy. I wonder how much of all of that is just improvised of Sinbad just riffing. I think 100% of it. <laughs> <laughs> Howard politely declines, but Myron doesn't take it all that well. And it goes from let's start a team to just you're out against me. Well, I like how... Myron then ends up saying something about like your little nice little suede shoes. I was good enough And then the first thing I thought is, why is he wearing suede out in like the Midwestern slush and snow? <laughs> Does he not care? He's flaunting all that I buy a new pair every week. <laughs> He's flaunting all that money from all the customers with mattresses, I guess. That's what the overtime is for. <laughs> Obsession with sweet. He goes back to a DSW and they're like, you're our number one customer. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes, I am. I am. <laughs> Just as they start to argue, a bystander runs by mentioning that a toy store received a late shipment of Turbo Mans. Which, that's when they... If it's such hot news, why would you shout that to everybody else? I would keep that to myself and be like, I'm not telling a soul. Yeah, for real. And especially by the yeah, time till you get your till you get yours, yeah. You, yeah, then you you can tell people. I know I'm guilty of that. If I'm hunting for something something fierce, I don't mention it to anybody else that would be remotely interested. I want want to make sure that I'll get mine first, and then I'll mention like, hey, they have this here. Yeah. Uh, when they hear the news, they end up rushing over to their cars. Arnold's a little bit faster on the take. He gets in his car, throws it in reverse, and slams on the gas while Myron is still trying to pull his mailbag into the car. Um, but just as he slams into reverse, he also slams into a police bike. And when Arnold goes over to try to pick the bike back up with the rearview mirror kind of falling off the handlebars, that's when we see that it's the same patrolman that pulled him over at the beginning of the movie. And once the camera kind of looks up to see who the cop was, that's when it cuts. But uh, I'm starting to feel bad. He broke his mirror. <laughs> we don't see anything more with this interaction, but can only imagine he probably got one hell of a ticket. Honestly, I'm surprised he wasn't detained at that point. Yeah. At least that's just me anyway. Oh, wow. I completely missed the mall of, that he was at the Mall of America. Yeah. It's cool to see. I mean, it's fucking huge. I don't know if it's... I've been there once. Yeah. Was it somewhat recently or was it like years ago? Uh... <sighs> 12 plus oh, years ago. Yeah. I would want to go during the 90s, like the heyday of malls, like 80s, 90s yeah. era. I can only imagine the parking lot. Oh my God, that must be terrible. Oh, yeah. It'd take you 45 minutes to go from the parking lot to even the entrance. I feel like that's the kind of mall that would have a shuttle. I mean, the, the like the jungle gym play area that you see, I don't know if it actually exists in that mall, but I could easily imagine it to have something like that. And if that is real, that place must be amazing. And I can only imagine what else would be there. Yeah. Our mall wasn't bad, but I mean, by mall standards, it wasn't great. Yeah. I feel like the big advantage ours had is that it had a movie theater on the property that later got added into the mall itself. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a big plus just being able to hang out with friends and walk over and just see a movie. It's a one-stop shop. So we cut back to Arnold. He's now in the mall, and he's walking toward the toy store. And uh, he hears that the store... Listen up, people. Answer your first question. Yes. The rumors are true. We have received a small quantity of the action figure known as Turbo Man. <laughs> but with how many people are already swarming the employees that... It's funny, because the guy is making the announcement, like the store manager... He's making the announcements to the crowd using like this toy microphone and boombox <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to help so carry his voice. But um, there's already like 50, 60 plus people already waiting, trying to get in to see it, even though the store is open. He's so fucking angry. <laughs> the store employee. <laughs> the, yeah, the, 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 like the manager like voice. telling everybody. I mean, after 30 days of this bullshit, I, I don't blame him. 
So even though, you know, it's 25 days to Christmas, so you got that extra, like, almost a week and a half of Black Friday bullshit. And even leading up to it, I can only imagine he's just <laughs> done. I would just spend my paycheck, buy the shipment myself, and then just set it on fire in front of a crowd. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that he's he's like, if you're not one of the lucky few to get Turbo Man, we have plenty of booster and stock. <laughs> and they're like, we don't, we want, don't it. want it. Boo! <laughs> like the vitriol, just it's it's like a switch, immediate vitriol for booster. They just I kind of feel that though, because every time I go into the toy stores now, and it's been the same thing for I don't know, the better part of a couple of years at this point, um, with all the different Star Wars toys that come out you'll have the main four or five figures that everybody wants. And then for months on end afterward, every time you go into the toy store, you only see th three of the same figures and they'll have like a hundred of them. Eternals is going through that right now. <laughs> yeah. I think people only buy Salma Hayek and then the rest just sit on the shelf. Which is such a weird choice. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see Kumail Nanjiani either ever on the shelf. It's just the rest of them. So there's so many people outside waiting for this toy that the store announces that they're going to do it in a lottery fashion. I don't think this was wise, but... No. Well, plus the fact that the balls don't have any sort of, like, numbering on them. Not all of them aren't unique colors. So what are <laughs> they doing? Yeah, what's your end game here? Because uh, they're just asking for chaos. And that's exactly what happens. <laughs> so... They they start giving out the balls and, you know, people are trying to climb over each other, reaching, trying to grab any of the rubber balls that they can get their hands on. And the guy just, the, like the two employees holding the buckets, just throws the buckets into the air, releasing the contents all over the place. And it's just utter mayhem. Rubber balls go everywhere as the crowd riots trying to catch any that start bouncing everywhere. Um... Arnold tussles with the neighboring parents and Sinbad, who eventually maces him to steal the ball that Arnold caught. And I love how Myron like stands up, tries to get away, and he starts doing like a victory dance. And that's when Arnold, his eyes completely bloodshot. <laughs> I think that's and my some favorite other guy. Line. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and it's not even that line that gets me. It's the one immediately afterward where some guy just looks up and he's like, get the mailman. <laughs> and that's when he gets tackled down to the ground. The ball gets lodged, uh, dislodged out of his hand and it starts um, rolling and bouncing away. Which, But that's people getting thrown into the toy shelves and thrown over just displays like... Oh. Also, fucking... when they descend on Myron it's here, great. he starts yelling Rodney King. And I feel like that <laughs> yeah. really was out of place in a family movie. I think that joke was for uh, the adults. Earlier, when Arnold when Arnold wouldn't accept his like partnership, he was like, this is racism. Jesse this is what Jesse Jackson, Jackson, was, Jackson talking was talking about. <laughs> uh, yeah, he has lots of little... Lines that come and go really quick that are blinking. You miss some funny. Yeah, I I love every. It was always extreme, but he was fucking perfect <laughs> through this whole movie. I love I love Sinbad in this. Uh, with the ball bouncing away, Arnold chases after it, and that's when the ball eventually lands in the lap of a little girl, and he continues chasing. The girl with the just there's tons of people. It's hard for him to just, you know, beeline straight towards her. Plus, she's in a stroller being pushed by her mother and she's on a different level than he is. So he's rushing downstairs trying to catch up with her, who also is going downstairs. So by the time he catches up, she already managed to get herself into like a playground with a jungle gym kind of thing. And he's, you know crawling through the tunnels I, this guy is massive i'm amazed he fit in this plastic tunnel thing that they have <laughs> in there but uh you know he's trying to push his way through the kids that are actively playing through this um playground and he goes down a uh, like this plastic slide into a ball pit and the little girl is there and that's when he's trying to convince the girl to give him the rubber ball 
but before she can he could get it from her she decides to put it in her mouth and not even thinking he reaches for her mouth and he you know just grabs her, <laughs> grabs face. her face and that's when the girl's mother sees and starts attacking him with her purse and other mothers start running over and hitting Arnold the whole time, calling him a pervert, <laughs> forcing him to walk away <laughs> as the little girl gets pulled out of the ball pit, um, trying to get away from Arnold as quickly as possible. Little girl has one of those bowl haircuts that would be like embarrassing to look back upon. Definitely. Bowl haircut and overalls. <laughs> that, nine, that 90s, the 90s. look. And then he's walking away and he's like, I'm not the pervert. I'm just trying to get the Turbo Man doll. (laughs) No, I'm not the pervert. (laughs) Was that LaFleur's? (laughs) Yeah, that was French. (laughs) That beard in the French. I was hoping you didn't say anything. (laughs) No, no. I'm not the (laughs) pervert. I feel like this is the, the whole Mall of America section is the lull in the movie for me at least. Between like the the setup, the initial stuff going on, and then I feel like it's it's not a three act structure. This is like <laughs> this is a four act structure, and this is like part th- two and a half before we yeah. actually get into the rest of it. Like, there's still funny lines, it's there's still stuff that I do like, but yeah. I'm like, it feels like this is the section that kind of drags a bit more. No, exactly. I didn't like this section much, and I usually kind of this is when I start fading out of the movie. Um, just as he's walking away defeated from the jungle gym playground. So then that's when we meet Danny Woodburn, who is playing the Tony the Elf, overhears him as he's trying to get that Turbo Man doll, and he kind of like, hey, you know, you, come here. He walks over, and he sees that, you know, it's a Tony's, or um, Danny's playing, a, you know, an elf. And sure enough, he looks over and he sees Jim Belushi playing a mall Santa. And Santa confides confides to Arnold that he actually has a Turbo Man, and I love how he shows him a picture of the doll <laughs> with like today's newspaper. <laughs> yeah, like a Polaroid. I'm, I'm usually not a Jim Belushi fan. Like it's, I could take him or leave him, but I think he just works as the shady, fast talking huckster Santa in this. I was yeah, I had that same thought. I was like, I think he gets he gets a lot of flack, but I'm like this. Role was, I think was my dislike for. of Jim Belushi was just because growing up watching like TJI Fridays and whatnot, uh, or on whatever chant network it was like ABC, NBC, when they started with like <laughs> According to Jim, and I was like, I don't want to watch According to Jim. Get back to the shows I want. <laughs> Damn you, Jim Belushi, delaying my Sabrina the Teenage Witch. You know, and this is he he get completely gives off that. Um mob scam artist kind of vibe yeah and arnold isn't buying into it but he quickly caves total grifter because i mean he's oh, is that what you call it a grifter yeah uh yeah i mean it's just another oh. word another word I, to I say. Know. con man um you could tell arnold doesn't want to go along with it but he's he's desperate so you know he actually caves and this is where we meet uh the second deleted scene uh, we see them. Oh shit! This this scene is stupid. Um, oh, so we see Arnold driving the two of them in his car, and they're driving through the city. Arnold's growing impatient, saying that they've been driving forever, and he starts just venting his frustrations to the Santa Claus. Meanwhile, all this time, in touch with his feminine side neighbor, he's busy attacking my wife's cookies. All right. Hey, spare me the details of your twisted life, pal, okay? Yo, is this genuine leather? Don't touch it. And the whole time, um, Danny Woodburn is actually, like, looking at the interior of his car. It's like, hey, is this this made out of real leather? And Arnold just kind of quickly looks at him like, would you fucking knock it off? And that's it. Wait. They pull up and... That might make sense later then. Because later in the movie, when Howard gets a like he gets out of a tow truck outside of his house and they yeah. originally i thought it was he was getting dropped off and i was like oh yeah be, like he has to be getting dropped off because that can't be his car in the back because his car is like 
it's completely stripped and it has like Merry Christmas spray painted on the side of it. But if that's the case, I'm wondering if this he, scene is he, setting up that the Santa stripped his car at the other place. Oh, could I didn't even think of that. He finds his car stripped at the diner. But the fact that it says Merry oh, Christmas. Oh, yeah, because he pushes, scene. he has his car and he pushes it to the diner after all this happens. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But that would make a lot of sense, though, because who would write Merry Christmas? It's almost like a message being sent to him like hey you fucked us so we're gonna fuck you right back <laughs> but at the same time it just they all got arrested so it doesn't make too much sense but it's my head the surviving members that. are hunting him down yeah. it's like judgment night with dennis leary <laughs> you don't want to get on santa's bad side <laughs> you just have like one santa claus clinking candy canes together outside the window <laughs> <laughs> so yeah the uh the the, the Howard. <laughs> the deleted scene's quick. Um, I didn't like it, realizing once... They, oh, hey, this wasn't in the theatrical cut, and it was just it's super quick, but it's really... I think it sets up that one line, and that, that's really it. Um, I do like when they cut back to the actual movie. Jim Belushi's rendition of, like, Little Boy That Santa Claus Forgot for some reason randomly gets stuck in my head around Christmas time. And I don't think I've ever heard whatever the real version of that is, but this is what comes to mind. Wait a minute. That's not in the regular cut either. Yeah. Oh, it's not? He, he In the car, no. I think he is... No. He does sing it in the theatrical cut, but there's an extended scene oh. where he actually oh, sorry, sings yeah. I thought that's what you the were referring whole to. thing. Oh, then I only heard the, the theatrical cut because it's only like the last 25 seconds. It's like three bars. Well... Merry Christmas, you filthy animal. <laughs> like mana from heaven. It cuts but after the whole car scene, they pull into the this warehouse. Um it's a Santa <laughs> compound being and they get let in by a secret password of Jingle Bells Batman smells. Just when they pull up to the gate out front and it's just a guy with like an overcoat a trench coat and a, a German shepherd, but he has the Santa beard and the Santa hat. Like that's the, <laughs> it's like, I was like, are we going to see an entire room full of just everybody's wearing Santa? Clothes? I half yeah. expected it to be like, it's so unnecessary, but like, it's like in TMNT. Ridiculous. The first time we see the inside of the foot clan hideout, they're like playing the music over the speakers. It's like <laughs> Santa's doing skateboarding things. Little did we know, this is actually the Foot Clan, but this is just what they do during Christmas time. They try to give back to the community by selling knockoff and stolen product that they managed to find throughout the rest of the year. Santa sends a message. <laughs> Slap. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Miss O'Neill. <laughs> We've been shopping for you, Miss O'Neill. That explains the, all the bells they have to remove when they go to test. <laughs> These are leftover bells from, the, from Christmas. Blink and you miss a uh, Vern Troyer. No, I guess only if you blink three first, times. You blink and you miss him, but he has a. <laughs> but if he, <laughs> he has a a big moment later yeah, on. Yeah, I, I when I saw him, I was like, "Is me, that me Vern himself. Troyer in like old age makeup and like glasses?" Is it really? I didn't look up that elf. I didn't recognize him. Yeah, he's got a goatee. Like a, it's not a full beard. It's just a goatee. <laughs> yeah, inside this warehouse, it's there's dozens of Santas and uh, Santa's little helpers hustling around, moving different product. Um, it the whole thing screams like this is a scam, but yeah, there are, there are dozens of people in here. Howard even looks around, and the look on his face is just like. Huh. Yeah, because Belushi's like, I know what you're thinking. And Howard's like, you have no idea what I'm thinking. So here's that extended scene where uh, Jim Belushi does sing uh, The Little Boy That Santa Claus Forgot. And he's actually joined in by all the other Santas in the warehouse. Then I have seen that scene. It was on the VHS version when I was a kid. Because now I'm remembering all of them singing together as like back up to him. Yeah, that yeah, that's the deleted. Scene. So yeah, so I guess the original VHS version included those scenes. It didn't. 
but I don't know which version you might have had. And I think this might be extended, oh, okay. not deleted. Because I know he does sing the song, but I don't remember all of those Santas singing. But I don't know. I don't actually have I, the only copy of the original I have is the original on VHS. Yeah. So I'm not I'm not sure. And I haven't seen that one since I owned a VCR like a decade ago. I'm not sure. So after the rendition, um, Belushi asks for three hundred dollars for the Turbo Man doll, which is pretty steep. But Arnold did. Do we know we don't know what it retails for, no. do we? I mean, at the time in the 90s, probably 20, 30 bucks. But then again, yeah. he offered three times whatever the lady paid for Booster. And she happily accepted it. And he didn't even blink. So maybe he just didn't want to spend $300 twice in one day. But I don't know. It's That's true. still pretty steep. So Arnold's gut feeling tells him to open it immediately. And he finds out that... When he's given the doll, it's already wrapped in a Turbo Man themed like wrapping paper. So when he opens it up, he finds that the doll's actually in Spanish instead of English. So he gives him like a death <laughs> glare. And then when he tries to rip open the box to see the toy itself in his hands, um, he sees that the, the toy is just a cheap knockoff. He gives a he gives true lies glare here, like he's about to start <laughs> killing. If the toy was just the Spanish edition, like as a kid, I probably would have been fine with that. I would have been like, <laughs> even cool, Belushi man. tries to justify it, like it's multicultural, it's educational. <laughs> yeah, but when he opens it and then like all the pieces just fall apart, I'm like, no, no, that doesn't fly. Yeah, some assembly required. <laughs> He demands to get his money back, but that's when uh, he finally calls him out for just being a sle sleazy con man in red suits. Arnold Thesaurus calls them out for what they are <laughs> and entices Arnold to start a fisticuffs brawl with a warehouse full of mall Santas. North Pole hell in a cell. This is where the extended scene, I think, comes in because I don't remember some of the combat that occurred, but a fellow nunchucker of candy canes <laughs> comes out. But uh, that fight ends too quickly. It kind of reminded me of like Indiana Jones because the guy does some crazy spin moves with the candy canes, but um, <laughs> Arnold just finds a oversized one and takes him out that way. When he, I mean, the physics get ridiculous in the movie, but it's funny. But when he snaps Belushi's beard to start the fight, and he just does that end over end roll backwards like a pencil going in. We don't know end. how much tension was on that beard. <laughs> like I said, the physics don't make cleanly up, takes his jaw funny. right through the back. I don't want to say the movie jumps the shark at any point, but this is definitely that jumping the shark bit. <laughs> this movie is perfect with no issues whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah ninjas i still but, think the uh, indiana jones bit would have been better if instead of grabbing a candy cane he actually just takes out a gun like indy <laughs> <laughs> pulls out the nunchucks and he just takes one step back and just fires oh, like a sharpened candy cane and just throws like a throwing knife <laughs> but the part that is in the movie is um or the theatrical cut is after he takes out the candy cane nunchucker um he's i did sorry i did he is in the one i watched on hulu the nunchuck oh, guy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I watched it on he Disney starts, Plus. He starts swinging the an oversized candy cane as like a club, but um, that's when he meets a huge Santa played Santa. by Paul White, aka the Big Show. Santa Prime. Well, well, it's the Big Show. Sorry. Is that like his intro music? That's his intro. <laughs> <laughs> Arnold tries to fight the Big Show, and it's just literal david versus goliath it's just it's not happening when he has the other elf on his back like attacking him and then he dips down when big show throws like the haymaker and he knocks out the other guy and then he just does little buddy little buddy Burn that Troyer. always makes me laugh just like big yeah. show's delivery on the line <laughs> I give him props for trying to take on Arnold that way, but on, like that was just a dumb idea. Let me get on his shoulders and try to hit him. That was a. There's a continuity or weird thing here. Arnold gets up after that and punches Big Show, but his head goes the opposite direction. <laughs> like he punches left to right, and Big Show goes right to left. I was like, oh. well, maybe put a little Probably bit of that to... English on it. 
<laughs> just a little of that knuckle spin. <laughs> yeah, it's at this point in the the brawl that um, the cops actually burst through the door completely unannounced. And I love how they, they yell out, like, instead of like, ah, oh, it's the fuzz or it's the cops, they call them the Grinch. <laughs> I thought the cop that walks in first and starts, like, shouting was um, Robert Costanzo, who was Harvey Bullock in the Batman animated series, because it sounded like him. Um, but I guess it was, uh, was like, Alan Blumenfeld, who played in the Flintstones movie. He was the fake Fred Flintstone, which makes sense, because... Yeah. Yeah, from a far shot, it did kind of look like him, but then when it you see them much closer when they he starts talking to Arnold and you know that oh that's it's not him. But yeah. no, you're right. I he did look um somewhat familiar. And it's not like some people won't replay the same uh like typecast kind of thing. Cause I mean like Reginald Wall Johnson was a cop how in how many movies that he was in? All the ones I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Arnold uh, uses this time. He knows he's busted, and he manages to find a toy police badge, and he flashes it really quickly to one of the one of the cops that's about to interrogate him. Hey, buddy! This must be the sloppiest bust I've ever seen in my entire career on the force. Detective Howard Lang, undercover. I have been working on this case for the last three years, and you guys come barging in here like a bunch of terrorists at a tea party. Which, wait, the thing that surprised me is he's like, Detective Howard Langstrom, and then he just starts talking, and I'm like, wait, did you use your real name while impersonating a detective? <laughs> I probably did the same thing. I couldn't think of a fake name, like... He looks yeah, around yeah. the room, like, out the window is a Howard Johnson. And then he looks over, and it's, like, Man Bat. <laughs> and he's like, uh, Howard Langstrom. And he's like, ah, no. <laughs> Family Guy has a bit on that. So this clever escape now behind him. He drives off and runs out of gas. And we now see him push it to a nearby diner. We cut back to um, his house and we see that Ted's outside and he's throwing this weird little event showing off the reindeer to his neighbors and, you know, inviting them over so they can come over, take pictures, pet them, do whatever 90s people do back then. To reindeers. So this is kind of awkward, but um, Jamie and Johnny, um, they're the kids are talking. <laughs> this exchange. And Jamie understands, <laughs> like, the the tension that's happening between his parents and he's trying to, you know, just talk and vent about it to what I think uh, Jamie thinks is his friend, but I don't think that's the case anyway, but I, I don't um, think Johnny was a bad kid. Like they seem to get along the whole time. And that Johnny, was obnoxious. Well, Johnny never seemed to say anything with like malice. It was just like, he thought he was honestly helping. That's true. And I'll, then like I'll later when Jamie gets to go on the float and whatnot, or like, they're going to the parade. It's not like, oh man, that should be me. It's like he's excited for him. Yeah, that's that's true. But the kid mentions to Jamie that, you know, well, my dad went through a divorce and it did him wonders. Maybe it'll do the same for your parents. <laughs> and J this upset Jamie quite a bit. So he runs into his house, clearly upset, you know, Um Meanwhile, Ted is still trying to flirt with Liz. She's not paying attention. She's focused on Jamie. And she sees that he's upset. And he runs into the house. And she chases after him. You see him walk into the house. And just as he walks in, that's when Howard is calling the house to check in for the second time today. So he picks up the phone. Or uh, Jamie answers the phone. And that's when he realizes, like, oh, it's Dad. You know, hey, how are you? Well, how's it going? You know, are you going to make it to the parade today? And he's like, yes, yes, Jamie, I promise. And Jamie really is big into Turbo Man. So he shares with him, like, one of his favorite quotes from Turbo oh, Man. Like, always keep your promises if you want to keep your friends. And this causes Howard to crack because he's just so stressed out from today with all the bullshit he's gone through. He's trying to find this stupid toy for his kid. He's not having any luck. And the last thing that he wants to hear is anything regarding this Turbo Man guy. So he ends up yelling at his kid. Enough! 
Enough of this turbo man, okay? I had it up to here with this turbo man. If there's anyone I don't want to have advice from right now, it's turbo man. Jamie cuts right back. And if anything, cuts even deeper, saying that, you know... What would you know about keeping your promises? You never keep your promises. You never do anything you say you're gonna do. Ever! Did we pass by the She's Next Door Pet and Ted? Yeah, I was gonna bring that <laughs> I up. I didn't even write that down. <laughs> I just love when he's like, where's your mother? And she's like, oh, she's next door, Pet and Ted. And Arnold's just like, what? <laughs> I forgot they named the reindeer Ted. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he uh he did not get that memo. I mean, it's kind of understandable that Howard kind of snaps on Jamie because he calls because he needs to get in touch with the mother. And he's like, Can you put your mother on the line? Where's your mother? Can you put your mother on the line? And Jamie kind of like three times just kept talking about like are you going to be Turbo there, Man. Dad? I, I'll, I'm going to be there. Where's your mother? Because you have to keep your promises. Uh, I will. Where's your mother? Because as Turbo Man always says, it's like, <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. I. Uh, that's one of the things I dread about having kids eventually someday is that you're going to have to talk through them because they're going to be so hung up on one thing that I, I'm afraid of cracking and kind of yelling at them for something that they're just being innocent about because it's as much as I understand Jamie's frustration of, you know, you're never there for me. At the same time, Arnold really just, I need to talk to your mother. Put her yeah. on the phone. Because it's like, and, for all he knows, it could be, yeah, there was an accident. I'm at the hospital. I'm trying to get in touch with her so she can come down here. Or like, I got picked up. I'm in jail. This is my one phone call. <laughs> <laughs> that one makes more sense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How do you explain to your kid that you're in jail, you know? <laughs> Trouble men's hair. He says he's going to die. Put your mother on the line. <laughs> you should have led with that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jamie just hangs up the phone, you know, slams, um, you know, slams it. Uh, <laughs> wow. It's been so long since I've used the expression because who does that anymore? He slams the phone down, right? Or <laughs> what's the expression? Oh, yeah. We never do it anymore. <laughs> It really takes a lot of the steam out of like getting into a an argument or like having yeah, somebody that you're let me angrily hit the, the end fall. Yeah. End I remember like years ago, uh, we had a telemarketer that was trying to scam us, and I think it was my dad that was on the line. And then finally he was like, Hey, uh, can you hear me? And he's like, Yeah. And then he slams the phone down. And you can't do that anymore. <laughs> where you have to make the slam noise as you hit end. Blah! But Jamie slams the phone on the back down onto the receiver. He's frustrated, and uh, that's exactly when the mom had been overhearing the conversation just enough, where she's just like, "Damn you, Howard!" She knows that he upset the kid because th this is so. They're at the diner, just kind of reminiscing on back when Jamie used to uh, not appreciate Howard, but back when Jamie used to actually like look up to him because Howard was able to do the correct thing for him. I think it was what? He was talking about building a tree house. Yeah. So he hangs up the phone and then as he's walking away, there's Myron again. And he's he's down on his luck, so he actually listens to him a little bit more and they're both kind of feeling depressed because they're still missing out on the toy and they think they failed. So they start reminiscing on like all the good times they had with their kid when it wasn't involving like material goods. But at the same time too he also, um, Myron brings up, like, you know, there was a toy back in the day that I really wanted as a kid. And it was the Johnny Action OMA gun, which I found out is real. Yep, the one-man yep. army gun. Yep. And uh, this is another extended scene. I'm not going to go into it, but he literally just describes every function of the gun. <laughs> he recites, like, a three-minute commercial for this gun. Pretty much. Yeah. But he described it like it's it's what is it like one man arc action gun and he says like it can do ten different things and he just lists all ten in the theatrical cut it only he only described like two or three of them. He explains the disappointment he had never getting a toy like that as a kid, and then Howard hallucinates seeing Jamie instead of Sinbad with fear of him becoming someone like By Myron, um, like how the kids you know drinking whiskey out of the little bottle that he had. But Arnold refuses to give up, and it kind of bolstered his morale. 
And this is when he hears on the local radio station that's giving away a Turbo Man. Well, KQRS has good news for you. If you're the first caller to correctly identify all eight of Santa's reindeer, you will be the winner of the hottest toy since Johnny 7 OMA. It's easy. Just call 555-KQRS. You know, which, fun <laughs> fact, this is exactly how I remember them. Yep. So whenever I have to recite the seven reindeer, I say it in the same canter that Arnold says it as he's jogging. Yeah. That's the only way I remember it. It, it has to be in the Desha Dancer Prince or Vincent Comic Cupid Donner Blitz. <laughs> yeah. There are eight reindeer plus Rudolph. Rudolph was plus. a corporate shill. Yeah. <laughs> they never let him play in Well, before games, Rain, so. Rudolph, there was eight. Tim's Googling it. Our interns are fact-checking. One moment. Oh, I'm right. There's eight reindeer? Wait, what? Or seven? There's eight. So Arnold hears the ad, and um, he, he rushes to the phone booth to um, call it in, but the rivalry between him and Myron kind of rekindles. And... Um, just as he manages to get online or like on the phone with the the DJ, Myron pulls the phone cord out from the actual phone booth, so it disconnects the call. So that's when the diner attendant is like, "Hey, you know the radio station's just kind of down the street. If you guys want to go, it's like not even like two blocks away." So they both rush out of the diner and they start running down the street, and Myron's trying to think who the reindeer are, but the whole time Arnold is, you know, reciting that little chant. Oh, I can run like this for miles. Dasha dance around the vixen, comic cubit down a blitz. Ha ha! Dasha dance around the vixen, comic cubit down a blitz. Dasha dance around the vixen. And, um, you know, he knows, like, he's got this. He's also Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's able to run without a problem, and Myron is having a really tough time trying to keep up. So with that massive lead that Arnold has, he manages to um, run down the street, run into the studio, and he doesn't really give the DJ enough time to kind of react. He pretty much just bangs on the glass and kicks down the door. Right. Let me in. Let me in. I got the answer. Come on. I got the answer. Yes, I got the answer. Open up. Open up. Yeah, I got a madman in my studio and... Uh... Well, I like how he's calling the police and Arnold's banging on the door and then Arnold just like puts a boot to it and just blows clean through the door. And he's like, uh, please help me. <laughs> <laughs> he's shitting his pants. He, um, Arnold is not even paying attention to what anything that the DJ is saying. He's just shouting out reindeer names and like, <laughs> I win, I won. And then he's kind of exclaiming in like happiness, like, oh, I finally got it. And he asks, like, you know, it's where, where, where's the Turbo Man doll? But just as um, he thinks he's won and he starts to celebrate, the DJ starts to say it's not that simple. And that's when Myron bursts through the door. <laughs> and uh, he reaches into his mailbag and he pulls out a package and he claims that it's a bomb. And that's when everyone freezes and they're like, oh, shit, you know, they're going to take him seriously. Answer the win. I got this. Now what's that? This master track star is a homemade explosive device. A bomb? Oh. Yes, in layman's terms. And he's gonna. He wants to. He'll use the boom bomb until he gets that doll. And during their arguing, um, Myron actually drops the box that he claims to be the bomb. But as it hits the ground, you know, everyone ducks down. They cover their, you know, their body with their arms trying to protect themselves. But the the box hits the ground and then you start to hear chimes of the music box. And when Arnold grabs the the package, opens it up and sees that it is actually a music box. He's just about to punch Myron when the DJ says that, you know, we never had a Turbo Man in the studio. And instead he takes out a gift certificate and they both kind of look at him like, are you are you insane? That's that's what you guys had planned this whole time is just to give out a, a gift certificate. And they definitely aren't happy about it. No, no. What I actually said was whoever won would get a doll eventually. 
<laughs> you see, what we have here <laughs> oh, is a gift certificate. A gift, gift certificate. certificate. Right. <laughs> Arnold <laughs> cocks back that he's going to punch <laughs> this guy because of his misunderstanding. <laughs> like he was ready to beat him. Like, oh my God. You almost killed a man. You should, you should lay low after all this is done. I know this farm. There's a there's a there's another funny l line from Sinbad here. He's like, "I've been under a lot of pressure since the zip code plus four thing <laughs> ever came into existence." <laughs> when he's like holding the bomb. <laughs> Once they discover the, the gift certificate thing, you can start to hear police sirens come up, and uh, camera even cuts to seeing like a bunch of squad cars pulling up to the station. And by the time the gift certificate is revealed, Howard, you know, takes it from him, and that's when the cops burst into the room. Or right. they rush out, and just as they're leaving the studio booth, that's when the cops come in. But um, with them pretty much cornered, that's when Myron decides to use the same bomb trick with the cops. Arnold, <laughs> knowing this is not going to work, he just kind of sneaks out the back. So the cops don't try to call his bluff on this. So Myron puts the box down thinking that it'll be safe. And then he and Arnold escape separately, but they, they still manage to escape. So the cop leading this um, crew... He walks up to the box and you, we see that it's the same cop that's been following Arnold through the whole movie in the beginning and then, you know, the run in with the bike. Oh, you shouldn't mess with that. Relax, Barky. I was on the bomb squad for 10 years. You've been duped. <sighs> this is nothing but a harmless Christmas package. I have to say, I was writing... Where was, where's my note here? I was typing as I watched this. I was like... <laughs> uh, and then Arnold runs out of the building and it just blows out. And then as I was writing that, the bomb... like I, I was writing a joke. Like, oh, it'd be funny if it like the <laughs> windows blow out. <laughs> like when Arnold's leaving. And then I died because I didn't realize this was going to happen. <laughs> like the surprise... Exp I laughed because I just... As I was writing the joke, he actually exploded. <laughs> a spot to say you got three in that blast. <laughs> you're like a like a fortune teller with a gift <laughs> what if when Arnold left the house actually exploded what if you lost this power <gasps> oh no and now every time I say what if it comes true I said what if the house blew up and it blew up I have this tremendous responsibility what if I lose this power oh my god I just said what if I lose this power what have power? you done <laughs> you had this power now you lost it <laughs> so that gives us uh some of our favorite line nick that is the other part yeah so after it cuts from arnold we see uh sinbad trying to get into an elevator and he's just like that bomb is real it's a sick world we're living in sick people <laughs> <laughs> best part too is you think about it he was carrying that bomb this entire time yeah <laughs> with how great of a uh exemplary employee he must be with the postal service i don't think he delivered a single package that day and um <laughs> that mailbag was with him from the start of the day all the way up until now so he was carrying a bomb for the last at least six seven hours crazy what if so earlier in the movie when he's hitting people with his mailbag what if that's when it went off they toss oh out God. all those rubber balls. He hits Howard <laughs> with it, and it just detonates. So it blows out all the windows of KB Toys. We uh, cut back to the, the police squad that's there that just experienced the explosion. And since this is a kid's movie, he uh, looks like a bomb went off in his, his hands, exactly how you would expect if this was a Looney Tunes cartoon. So he has like the black soot all over his face. His hair is kind of like blown back and his hands are just completely messed up from it. <laughs> He's Gone. okay. But with all the, I mean, it's a bomb in a real life. He wouldn't be standing, let alone alive at this point. But he, uh, he's just pretty badly injured with his hands, but that's about it. The other cop all of a sudden cuts over to him and he's like, how many years of the bomb squad did you say? But that yeah. cop 
looks pristine. And it's like, mm-hmm. how, where were you when he picked that up? Did you like dip behind into the next room? Unless um, the main cop was, he pulled like a, he jumped on the grenade kind of thing. Once he realized it was a live bomb, he was like, tell my wife I say hello. Was she already dead? <laughs> <laughs> Howard makes it back to his car, and that's when we find that it's been stripped completely. Um, tires missing, the car is just completely disheveled. Graffiti on the windshield that just says Mary Xmas on it, and it's poorly spelled, too. Uh, he gets it towed back to his home, and I think this is the last deleted scene where we see Howard practicing his explanation of why he has the gift certificate instead of the real toy to his wife. And the driver of the tow truck just kind of looks at him and critiques and tries to coach him on what to say. (laughs) But look, I got a gift certificate, which is just as good. Uh, Too happy. Show a little emotion. Emotions? Oh, Liz. I'm so sorry. I didn't get one. She's like, maybe too much emotion. I don't think you know what you're doing here. And that's when the scene ends. It's another really quick one but oh um, i didn't see that scene but i remember reading something about how the actress who played the tow truck driver is the one who played sarah connor in terminator like the other sarah connor when he's searching through all the names in terminator she's like the first one he meets or something yeah i didn't place her but when you say that now that i look at that shot yeah that's definitely her that's funny on how you know 10 years later during a scene yeah i wonder if like again. a call was made to be like hey sarah connor <laughs> <laughs> i need you in the movie yeah that that's actually really cool didn't realize it because i know she looked familiar but i couldn't place her at all but i did feel like i seen her in something else i just couldn't put my, put my finger on what it was because i read it and i was keeping an eye out but then because that must be like the deleted or extended scene like i didn't see it in my version and it was like oh i I guess not. Because I remember it was the, the, they said the tow truck driver. Oh yeah. And top comment on that, uh, the clip I shared is that the tow truck driver was played by Marianne Mulleriel, whom also played the wrong Sarah Connor in the first Terminator. Smiley face. (laughs) The original title of that film. Terminator. Smiley face. Here we start the final act. Um, or the start of the final act, anyway. Uh, after his explanation attempt with the tow truck driver, he gets dropped off at the house, and he walks uh, as he walks up um, to his house. He sees through the window Ted on a ladder, putting the star on his Christmas tree, and then he sees Liz come around the corner and she starts talking to him. So he can't hear what's going on behind the glass, but. We, the camera and audience, go into the house to see Liz is like, wait, wait, what are you doing? That's Howard's job. That's his thing. That's his big thing every year. Don't do that. We're intentionally waiting until like when he's like that. It's the time. It's our tradition. He's like, oh, okay. Sorry about that. He takes it off and he puts it away back in the box. Arnold doesn't see or hear this exchange. All he sees is this man eating his wife's cookies, putting his tree with his star, and this just sets him off. Put that cookie down. So with him being as stressed out, he kind of has like a psychotic breakdown. And he recalls in his head that Johnny has a turbo man already (laughs) wrapped in under Ted's tree. Well, I like how they... the. You hear the audio of Phil Hartman like, oh, I already got it. And it's wrapped in under the tree, under the tree, wrapped in under the tree. But it reminded me of like a (laughs) Simpsons bit, just hearing like Phil Hartman's voice again, doing all of that. Yeah. (laughs) Nothing at all. So Arnold rushes to Ted's house, knowing that there's a turbo man here. He picks the lock with his credit card. And Arnold heads to the tree and sees the Turbo Man Man box, and he grabs it. Meanwhile, this is when Liz puts the Christmas topper away. Um, Ted overhears... 
I'll mm-hmm. forgive Howard going over to the house and stealing a toy from under the tree, seeing as Ted is literally trying to have an affair with his wife. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Not even an affair at this point, but more just sexually assault. Yeah, I'm amazed. I- I'm amazed they haven't kind of, you know, pushed him away. It's completely inappropriate. And yeah, he might be able to bag any other lady in the entire neighborhood. She's clearly not going for it. And he explains his reasoning later, but it's so thin that, come on, man, it's not her playing hard to get. She really doesn't want to do any of that. But yeah, you're a slime ball, Ted. You're a slime ball. <laughs> Mr. Ted. Mr. Ted. He really is a heel. This will be my favorite physical gag of the movie coming What, out. Howard Pretty having fun. the change of heart before facing off against a deadly reindeer opponent? <laughs> no. The oh. turning <laughs> head of Balthazar. Balthazar. <laughs> So just after the whole thing with the Christmas tree topper, Ted hears carolers around the corner. So he kind of literally grabs Liz and runs outside so that they can listen. And uh, this is the perfect opportunity for Arnold to sneak out the back. So with the carolers distracting everyone in the front of the house, he goes out through the back of the house to try to uh, sneak back into his own. And that's when he sees the other Ted. And this thing is still pissed off at him for whatever reason. (laughs) And this being the reindeer. So the second he gets outside, there's like a quick kind of like, I see you, you see me exchange. And the reindeer charges at him. Arnold retreats back into the house, but reindeer is able to follow him. As Arnold is trying to run around the entire house trying to get away from the reindeer, the reindeer knocks some things over into the fireplace that's going on. It looks like Arnold... It, I'm pretty sure it's a real reindeer, and it's actually Arnold running from it in those a couple of those shots yeah. through the house. Like, I wonder what they show him. Like, the reindeer doesn't actually attack. He'll just, like, follow you. Because <laughs> he's, like, running from it, for real. I just thought that was interesting. Joke's on you. Run! <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Arnold accidentally sets fire to Ted's nativity scene that he has in the house. And that's where Balthazar, one of the, I think, three wise men, yeah, he's like trying to put it out, and he like boot kicks yes. it through the window. His head went into the fire because it. <laughs> That's the. <laughs> yeah, he almost hits the carolers with a literal flaming head. Just the kids screaming at it. Just it's <laughs> pretty good. But this was uh, in view of everybody else too. So when Ted and Liz go to check out what's going on, they see Howard there, and he's holding, you know the. Uh, wrapped turbo man doll in his arms <laughs> arnold did have a moment of um clarity though when he realized that you know when he left the house he kind of looked down at the toy and thinking like you know i got it this is it but then he thought like this isn't right this is meant for johnny this is it's just not cool i'm gonna put it back in the house and that's actually when the reindeer catches him and he runs away so he didn't have time to put it back under the tree when this whole thing happened so he's literally caught with his pants down and they come over and like arnold howard howard what what's in your hand what is that is that is that supposed to be johnny's why do you have johnny's toy so at this point um liz is just extremely disappointed with him and she's upset because clearly had the regardless of whether or not he chose to put it back he still had the intention and succeeded in stealing the toy so she's just like you know what ted can you drive me and jamie to the parade um arnold is pretty much now fully in the doghouse and i'm sure there's i'm amazed there's not more like ramifications to him stealing because it's pretty fucked up because not only did you try to steal basically my kid's toy from under the tree. You broke into my house and you destroyed my property by lighting my nativity scene on fire and kicking a flaming head through a window. Oh, so it seems like there's two home wreckers in the neighborhood. Right. (laughs) They, when they like their leave to go to the parade, they just leave him there in the house that he just vandalized. (laughs) Like they're like, well, see see ya. Yeah. He's going to, we're just trusting that since you've been well, caught, you're not going to do anything now. else nefarious. <laughs> after, after the parade and they get back, he's going to come home to a frozen house because the window's been broken for the last five hours. 
<laughs> really should have taken care of this before I went to the parade. Ted has other goals. Yeah. They just leave him. It's just funny. But um, when Arnold tries to leave, the reindeer charges Arnold one last time. And at this point, he's just, he's had it. And he gives the deer just one huge punch to the face to kind of bury the hatchet. <laughs> Real it works. Tommy you picked a wrong day. So that you picked the wrong day. <laughs> The noise the reindeer makes when it like just gets socked and falls <laughs> on the ground, it's just like, it doesn't even sound like an animal. It's just like a guy doing, <laughs> So after the uh, the punch to the face, we cut to Arnold and the deer now outside Jamie's outdoor floor. I thought it was a tree house, but it's not in a tree, but I don't know. So a um, shed. He made him a shed. Yeah. He well, just, I he like bought how him a sh- this is the same result uh, as... Keith, David, and Roddy, Roddy Piper fighting in They Live <laughs> of let's just duke it out, beat each other up, and now all of a sudden we're friends and we see eye to eye. He's just like having beers with this reindeer. Yeah, I, I like that. He's like, hey, you want more? And he just, you know, pours out another one for the deer. I thought that was funny. You know what's unrealistic <laughs> about this movie? Deer drinking beer? Um, I feel like that picture that Jake drew, Arnold looks too good. Is too good Jamie, for yeah. Janie? It's too good. It looks like a... It's like a comic strip. A better artist <laughs> imitating a child. Yeah. That's usually the case with those pictures. they done in a child a child style, but you, there's something... There's there's a randomness and off-the-cuffness that you can't replicate with a child. A lack of skill. It's like when people try to post online, like, <laughs> look at this essay my child wrote. And you look at it, it's like, you My mom used to do that for me. We would have, like, coloring contests at school, and she would be the one to do the coloring. <laughs> I would get, like, bonus points for it being so well done. In reality, it was so just her doing bitch. it. Yep. They're going to come yeah, back right. and take all your awards now. It was actually... Um, <laughs> Posthumously dishonored. It was making me laugh because that that um, YouTube group that I watch, Neebs Gaming. Um, you remember in the forest, the video game where uh, you're trying to find your missing son, yeah. and you kind of have to follow a breadcrumb of like clues that your son has left behind in random caves and shit, and they're always like little drawings. But they have an exchange where they find one of the drawings and he brought with him. How old is he? Like five, uh, maybe. He seems like he's a little behind in his. Skills. No, that's that's a five-year-old. That's like a two-year-old. No, I mean, no. You, if you don't draw every day, that's a, come on, that's a five-year-old. Five-year-old's not going to be fucking, you know, he's not going to be Michelangelo no, when he's five. Five years old, you should be shading, you should be using shadows. This is two stick figures. Well, he goes to public school, so. Couldn't help laugh. Have a very- and just when you mentioned on how the drawing looks too good for the child to be the one to have drawn it. <laughs> that's actually the same picture, too, that he is... Uh, drawing when they f- have their first heart to heart in the beginning of the movie or at least it's the completed version anyway i don't know when he had time to finish the little drawing in the span of like three hours because he was going to bed right afterward well he did pencils and then he sent it over to Inking. his other guy for of course inks and colors yeah probably knew a guy i should have known <laughs> so the wintertainment parade i like this this was also like the um, watching the like doing like frame by frame of the the toy store because as oh, um, yeah. you get to see all the different characters walking down the street. You have like Leonardo oh, from Turtles. Course. You see the Cabbage Patch Sonic Kids, the Hedgehog. Sonic the Hedgehog, Madeline. Yeah, the Tick. It yep, was the, tick, the Tick, Cat in the Hat. It was so cool to see. Well, so I of all of these guys that are walking around is like oh yeah leonardo sonic the tick and then johnny looks out and he's just like oh, the cat in the hat and then both of them get excited and they both high five and they're like yeah it's like is that like one of the one of the guys on your that list of like we, met him. we did it we met the cat in the hat in fairness to them this was before <laughs> the mike myers movie so where was sully rock'em sock'em robots so young so yep yeah. Also, I like how the the two anchors that are doing the presentation of the Wintertainment Parade, the guy is Gale Force, the weatherman. <laughs> never picked that up. 
which that's Phil Morris, who like I know he did the voice. I thought the voice sounded familiar. I had to look it up. He did the voice of Saint Walker on the Green Lantern show, and I guess now he's on like Doom Patrol and whatnot. Uh, but he has like a very uh-huh. recognizable voice. Seen so- wasn't he the lawyer in Seinfeld? I, don't I think know. he played a lawyer uh, in Seinfeld. No, that's all. Maybe I've I've seen a lot of Seinfeld, but I don't I don't recall Jackie Jackie Child him specifically. That's what his name was. Yeah, huh. I'm pretty sure that's him. So just before the parade, when we get to see all the characters, that's when we see um, Ted driving, and they get like they're, he's trying to find parking with um you know Liz in the passenger seat. They're trying to find parking, and that's when they realize, oh, the parade is starting. Mom, can we, you know, go and watch? And then, like, our friend Owen is over there. You know, you can come meet us over there while you guys park. And um, that's when we get to see all of the characters up close and personal, which is really cool. You're right, by the way, dude. It is. That's cool. Vindicated. You feel validated. (laughs) One point for Dean. So once the kids leave, though... Um, Ted and Liz are in, you know, Ted's car and she's starting to cry out of just the frustration of the whole situation. And this is when Ted tries to come on to her again, and she clearly still has no interest, but she does try to keep him at arm's length. And I mean this figuratively and literally, and he's begging to just have her finally open up and he tries to push himself emotionally onto her. But that's also too bad when this is when Arnold sees this. When he realized back at the the fort, when he looked at that shitty drawing that uh, Jamie had made, he's like, you know what? No, this is my family. I'm going to fix this. And he decided that he's going to call a cab and uh, head over to the parade. And at this point, he got stuck in the same kind of traffic. He got out of the cab and he started running toward the parade. And here is when he gets in view of Ted's car. He sees the two in the, you know, the front seat. And he just sees Ted trying to get, you know, close to his wife. And this fuels him in a, you know, barbarian rage. So he runs up to the car. But before he can get up there, he collides into somebody holding hot coffee. And, of course, it's the same cop from before. Hands completely bandaged (laughs) from the um, bomb incident that technically happened, what, maybe like two, three hours ago? (laughs) So good recovery on him to be... Out on the patrolling field. <laughs> Such dedication that he survives Doesn't a bomb take the rest blast of the day, and even. then goes back to work. Yep. It's like Howard performs charge, Officer. He just he just needs a hot shower and some bandages, and he's he's good. He's good, guys. <laughs> so Arnold runs away from Liz to escape the cop, and here's where Liz finally puts her foot down. She grabs the eggnog that Ted prepared and hits him over the head with the thermos and gets out of the car. Because at this point, he's really, he's pretty much professing, like, I thought you were into me ever since that one day at the barbecue. Like, she must have said something or the way that she asked a specific question of, like, I think it was, like, some stupid recipe. And ever since then, he thought, like, oh, she's completely into me. This is the one that I want. And he's been gung ho about it ever since. And she did not see eye to eye with him on this whatsoever. Good think it was eggnog and it not was eggnog. like hot chocolate. <laughs> yeah, he said, but, "Yeah." <laughs> she throws it on him, and you just hear like sizzle. He shows up later to get Johnny, just and it's figure. just like half of him is just like melted down his face. Come Robocop. With me, Sean. <laughs> I think it was. Hot. I think it was hot, but I don't ever recall drinking hot eggnog because that's. Kind of gross yeah, I don't think it's that. That sounds yeah. disgusting. Have some non-alcoholic eggnog. But it also explains why he's like, um, when Johnny's later on, like, Dad, you smell like barf. <laughs> like I could see that if he's been stuck with eggnog on him. Yeah, delicious. As Arnold's trying to run away from the cop, he kind of ducks into an alley, and then he finds an unlocked door. He goes into it to try to hide out even further. But this is when he... Uh, gets pulled away and he realizes that he actually snuck into like like a a movie set kind of thing so a producer comes up to him yeah yeah, prep area a producer comes up to him with like this headset and clipboard on and he's mistaking arnold for an actor and it's actually meant for the parade so arnold's (laughs) doing this is the point where arnold puts throws in his like signature grunts 
So people are just manhandling him, like, you know, stripping off his clothes, putting new clothes on him. And the camera's tight on the producer, so you don't see exactly what's being done to Arnold. You just know that he's being, you know... Um, assaulted. He's for... <laughs> Yeah, he's being assaulted with uh, a wardrobe change. And the producer is just rattling off all these different rules and these different things that, you know, they discovered over the course of like the last day or so during rehearsal. And Arnold's not catching anything that the guy is saying. And he just runs over like the controls to the suit and he's just shoving Arnold toward the exit. And that's where we see Curtis Armstrong, my favorite cameo through the movie. (laughs) And he's in this massive pink costume. Also, the producer looks really familiar, and I had to Google it. It's um, Steve Van Wormer, who the only thing I know him from is, do you remember the movie Meet the Deedles with, I think, Paul Walker? I just remember always seeing the poster as a kid of, like, the two guys, and, like, he's the one in glasses, and both of them have, like, the giant blue wave haircuts. I thought he was, like, related to um, Matt Stone because he kind of looks like him. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. At least I think it's Matt. I, I get their names mixed up. But like the, the other, one of the creators of South Park, Reamer. <laughs> Matt Stone has yeah. the fro. He plays Kyle. <laughs> Matt Stone has the fro. Trey's the blonde one. Right, yeah. Okay, yeah. So it is Matt. I, I thought he kind of looked like him. This this scene has a really bold shot, which is a high angle shot down in the parade. And they're in a back lot. And if you look... <laughs> You could you Ooh, can see the buildings end, and there's just like <laughs> other different looking buildings right behind them. <laughs> it's just like another set. Wait, is, is that the town center from Monster Squad? Um, yeah, I just noticed that. I was like, I knew, like being out here in LA touring a couple of the backlots, you just know what they look like, and it, you don't really you don't think about it in the movie. It's not like the movie is like, oh, this is. You just I just knew that was a back lot and I just saw this shot. I was like, wait, you could you could see like the sound stages. <laughs> I swear. <laughs> it's like the train like show. Blazing the saddles, the building just fake. start to fall. It's out. all for Howard. <laughs> I was like, this movie takes a really It makes sense turn. too, because like in a little bit too, when we see the aerial shot where you see him flying around and stuff, and you see that the square where the parade is it's weird on how it seems the entire population is in that one little square of the city and the whole rest of it is quite blank it's because they live in the matrix and the processing power isn't the high draw enough distances. to be able to render anything beyond the winter entertainment parade <laughs> as howard's flying all of a sudden there's just like pop in <laughs> so arnold gets uh put onto that rising elevator platform and then we realize that he actually is dressed up as turbo man and he found his way onto the float for the actual turbo man turbo man i like how the producer is talking to him and he's like and the microphone is going to have a voice modulator that way you get the correct modulation and tone And then you listen to it, and all it does is just digitize his voice. So it just sounds like Super Shredder. (laughs) Jamie Turbo Man. (laughs) Jamie. (laughs) So with him realizing that he's now Turbo Man, he's just eating it up. This is, like, amazing for him. Um, As he's, like, kind of cheering on the crowd, you know, he's excited. Uh... The announcers mentioned that the one lucky kid will get a special edition version of the Turbo Man action figure, which, to be quite honest, it looks exactly the same. I think maybe it had chrome gold on it, but I don't I don't know. But uh, the toy looked exactly the same. Just the only difference, I guess, would be that he would be given to the child by Turbo Man himself. So... Arnold picks up the toy and he's holding it in his hands and he realizes like, I, I did it. I just got to find Jamie now. So he starts looking through the crowd and he sees his kid and he finally does. He calls him up onto the float and he's about to give it to him when that's the exact moment when Sinbad reappears, who just like Arnold finding Turbo Man, Sinbad found the um, actor that's playing Dementor, the villain. He knocks him out and puts on the suit 
and tries to intercept Jamie. Um, and the whole scene plays out exactly as how it did in the beginning of the movie, where we see Turbo Man trying to rescue the kid from Dementor. He gets attacked by the demon team. And he has to use his rocket. And the whole thing plays out exactly as it how it did with the the show as it does in real life, which I thought was a pretty nice touch. <laughs> <laughs> no uh, foreshadowing when, there. When uh, Sinbad lands, they start booing, and he's like giving him the up your sign. <laughs> 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 like, was that in the script? <laughs> I had uh, Rocketeer cool. vibes as he was as he was oh, uh, flying percent. around. So at one point, he needs to literally fly to go and get his son he discovers that his suit does have a working jetpack which you know cool to throw it on a saturday morning cartoon superhero on a float in the middle of a holiday <laughs> parade man like what a what a debut for a marvelous technology just some parade in minneapolis <laughs> yeah right also what a downer for every <laughs> float that has to follow it and behind the heroic, uh, rippling, muscled man in a jetpack that actually works and flies around, we have <laughs> a great stop for a good ten minutes. Everyone's like, what the, the hell break. are they doing up there? <laughs> it's like a Animal House. They just like keep coming and just they don't stop. <laughs> just smashing into each other. <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, for our Macy's Day Parade, all we have is like a floating baby Yoda that's chasing a little ball. They get the real Turbo Man. <laughs> Turbo Man. You know, actually, fun fact, I've never, ever seen the Macy's Day Thanksgiving Parade, or the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Never. Like, uh, you never turn the t- television on and be like, there it is. I've only seen like 30 seconds of it. Yeah, never. Never? Your mom never put it on? all of my years. So a lot of action takes place here, and it's just uh, Arnold fumbling with the controls to his suit. He doesn't know how to fly a jetpack because, There's nobody in the world. Honest, I don't know anyone that knows... <laughs> Knows how to fly a jetpack, and the real world anyway, because I can name like Boba Fett being one of them, and you know he clearly doesn't. Really I love exist, when Arnold but... was getting suited up that a producer is like just like talking him hundred <laughs> miles a minute, like explaining like, yeah, so this is how you fly the suit, like yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah, forget the guy's name, but basically like yeah, and uh, John is recovering <laughs> oh, yeah. really well, and. Uh, Thanks for replacing John. He's sexually conscious now. <laughs> it's really kind of dark. <laughs> yeah, really. So clearly Myron understands his costume better than Howard does at this point. So he's like firing off his fisticuffs and Which is crazy because he fires his hand <laughs> and then it comes back and he has full control of it, like it actually yes. separates his hand. <laughs> And then it comes back to it. It's not a fake Don't hand. Don't think about it too much. So with Jamie having the toy, he ran away from the float trying to escape Myron, who is now chasing him. Jamie climbs up. Um, he goes into a, another alley platform thing. I, I I don't know at this point. He finds a uh, means of escaping through elevation. He climbs one platform that leads to a ladder that leads to the rooftop of a building that leads to some side decoration to a building that it tops with a Christmas tree. And the kid starts climbing that. This is easy to like 60, 70 feet off the ground. Good for him. Myron follows him the entire time and just the combined weight forces the tree to kind of um, break off the side of the building and hang so that it's, you know, 90 degrees sideways to the building. So they're hanging on for dear life. Whole time Myron is trying to grab the Turbo Man doll from the kid's backpack. And um, he finally succeeds, if I remember right. I quickly wrote all this in the notes. I don't have the play-by-play. But Myron manages to get the toy. Um, He loses his grip and he falls down onto the float that happens to be directly behind him or this under is him like the gross negligence uh, child endangerment yeah, like he... could have killed jamie <laughs> this is yeah this is they just both a comedy of dead. errors i'm jamie like getting away and being like 
the easiest way to avoid this is to just <laughs> climb a thousand feet into the air rather than just like going to my mom, the cops, anybody the irony else in is, the crowd. Is the, the float that Myron fell onto was the float for the police. Why didn't Jamie just run to that float? To that float. Yeah. Also, so Myron loses his grip because Howard throws a boomerang at him and then it misses him and they do the classic like, ha, missed me. And then it comes back around. It should have just hit him <laughs> dead in the chest and Very just got him right there. Halfway into Jamie. <laughs> and he just throws it and just thunk. <laughs> just I feel people falls. forget what a boomerang does. Because everyone always gets excited when they see the boomerang has missed, but they never remember that a boomerang comes back. But, c'est la vie. Myron gets defeated, and just as he falls, so does Jamie, and that's when Arnold uses his jetpack, grabs Jamie out of the air, successfully lands... And everyone's cheering, happy for them. Um, a really cheesy exchange happens here. At, so clearly, despite all of this, Jamie and Liz don't know that that's Howard because what? He has his hair covered? Austrian. So this guy with the same Austrian accent. eyes, nose, <laughs> mouth, and jaw of my father and a thick <laughs> digital Austrian accent. Hello, little boy. It's not even like a domino mask, like, covering up his eyes. It's literally just like a, a tinted visor, so you can see his whole face. So he must only tell his father by just his hairline. Jamie, I would get, because it's just, he probably doesn't see this as a person in a suit, and it's just, holy shit, Turbo Man is here. <laughs> They're on vacation, he puts on a baseball cap, and Jamie's like, <laughs> Dad? <laughs> Where is he? <laughs> He takes it back <laughs> off. He's like, oh, there you are. He says, he, he finally asked Turbo Man, like, but, you know, after all this, how did you know my name? And he's like, well, Jamie, it's because I am your father. And he takes off the helmet. And that's when Jamie screams, you know, no, it's not true. That's impossible. But that's a really good line. I'm going to remember that for the future. <laughs> Which I like how I was really like trivia and people are like, oh, yeah, it foreshadows like the it's funny that they use the I'm your father line because it, it's clearly it's because Jamie uh, plays Anakin Skywalker. And it's like this was 1996. The first movie of that trilogy wasn't until what? That it was released, but it, yeah, it, so, it filmed after this. So yeah, this he had what got like him stage credit to even audition. Yeah. Yeah. Anakin. It's like it, I feel like that's just a coincidence and not like, oh, so. Randy Cornfield <laughs> planted a yeah. a Star Wars reference yeah. because he knew that Anakin was going to be played think. by him yeah. three years later. No, that, that yeah, it is completely unrelated. Because I remember Lucas was going through pictures of, you know, the kids and trying to match them up with um, Mark Ham like as the as of the seventies, Mark Hamill and Carrie Fisher to see like could there be some kind of family resemblance? Because he didn't want to cast someone that looked so dissimilar that you couldn't see where it could come from. But at the same time, I don't know how that would have mattered too much, but anyway, Arnold is Anakin Skywalker. Can you imagine if Arnold is actually the grandfather of Luke and Leia? <laughs> Luke, I am your grandfather. What planet would he be from? He's the only person with that accent in the galaxy. <laughs> 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 Clearly, I'm from Kashyyyk. <laughs> Put the Wookiee down now. <laughs> Just chewing, making the noises, and Arnold doing his noises back to like yeah. back to back in conversation. <laughs> so yeah, uh, Jamie falls to his death, leaving Howard heartbroken over his failure of not being a father, but also a superhero. He can't maintain his relationship with Liz over this loss, so they separate. She goes with Ted. It's the only logical thing to do. So um, after everything Arnold went through to get his son this toy, Jamie refuses it, saying now he has the real Turbo Man at home. Oh. I wonder how he felt after that one. I know how Mom feels about that. <laughs> the best part is, Jamie, you really have no presents under the tree. Just take it, take it, please. <laughs> <laughs> 
Jamie, I'm not always going to be around. I'm a bad dad. Take the toy. I might be going to prison. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, I've I've done a lot of things today. <laughs> you know, I think if Myron wasn't caught, he probably would have gone to prison instead. It's one of those things where just somebody has to go to prison. Oh yeah. Doesn't matter who, just they need to put somebody in prison for what happened today. Well, I like how my note is Jamie gives Myron the doll before he is clearly locked away forever due to literally everything that's been done. It's like multiple counts of Also, he almost just got him killed like when we first meet him he choked a woman in broad daylight in front of everybody they have attacked each other they have destroyed stores they have destroyed locations they have broken into a dj booth impersonated an officer he had a real bomb and a fake Is bomb Mace that considered he a in. deadly weapon all sorts of stuff dead probably not deadly no myron is a Absolutely. domestic terrorist <laughs> and howard is not much better but we love them. We close with the best line in the movie. They get back home where Arnold thinks he had a successful Christmas Eve with his son. As he turned to turns to hug his wife, the movie ends with the dread on Arnold's face once again. His wife asking, with all you went through for Jamie, I wonder what you got me. And this is where we smash cut a to divorce. Arnold's face, zoomed in once more, fear stricken, just as it had in the beginning. You he just serves her papers. <laughs> Honey, I got you a divorce. <laughs> <laughs> and that, ladies and gents, is Jingle All the Way. I still enjoyed it. I don't think it deserves a 17% in Rotten Tomatoes. 17%. So what did you guys think of it? I think it holds up. I still I enjoy think, it. I liked it. I mean, this was my pick. So, I mean, Dean, what did you what I did think? I think it has a lot of good, uh, a lot of good moments. Um, I think... Good bones. Arnold goes back and forth between like acting. I mean, like just being like not a great performance too. Like he has really good lines and moments. So I think he's actually, I guess overall my least favorite part of the movie. Just, I guess all the situations and antics are still very funny. Um, it's, it, it pushes not the boundaries, but it's like it, it, there's a little bit of edge to some of the jokes and like, the dark things if you think about them too long it's funny yeah i mean that was the 90s which it wasn't as bad as the 80s 80s was even more so but yeah i i i recommend it it doesn't get a rotten from me this has always become a, a movie i watch during christmas time basically i mean I, i'll never watch this during like you know july but um every year i usually end up watching this and this is just one of my christmas movies that i watch every year so i mean it's pretty reoccurring thing but usually whenever i watch it too i don't watch it watch it it's just background noise while i'm doing something else just trying to stay within this season i do like it you guys have any closing thoughts comments queries concerns what happened to neighbor that's ted that's me. all i want to know i wonder what happened to sinbad <laughs> both of them we need a better call Saul style a series about them. Yeah. Yeah, with Larry, the cableman. So that wraps up another episode of Screen Refresh. So again, if anybody wants to chime in on their thoughts about Jingle All the Way, any of your other favorite movie memories, or even, you know, like toy hunting exploits, let us know over at Screen Refresh on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. Or even shoot an email over at uh, screenrefresh at gmail.com to just give us a shout. So for Tim and Dean, this is Nick signing off. Your number one customer.